I'm going to start the meeting. I formally open the 2021 Town of Deerfield meeting and call it to order. I've determined that a quorum is present and I have examined the return of the warrant and find it in order. At this point, I'd ask you all to stand and uh, we'll recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And the flag is in the outfield. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for coming out today and for being kind of flexible here in these last couple of days as uh, the weather has, has played with us, but uh, FCAT and many town employees have done a, a tremendous job again to make sure that we could, could pull this off this morning, so we're appreciative. Um, absolutely. Uh, as you've seen from the warrant, we do have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, it's my job to kind of keep that, that dis those discussions moving, um, but make sure that everyone that has something to say is able to do that and that they're able to listen and deliberate properly. So I'd, I'd ask you all to work hard to respect each other's opinions, to make your uh, statements as concise and helpful as possible, and uh, let us move through the, the important business of the town. Um, According to our bylaws, to speak or to vote, you do need to be a town resident. So town residents should be seated here. If you're a non-voter or non-town resident, there's three seats over here, and we can also bring in some more if that's necessary. Um, at a check-in, everybody would have received a packet uh, in the first section of the bylaws. So those bylaws are a portion of the bylaws. Those bylaws are kind of the first set of rules that control how we run this meeting. So. Uh, I'll be referring to those at various times, and you can feel free to as well if you have questions as to procedure. On top of that, uh, our town meeting is run by a publication called Town Meeting Time. Uh, so sometimes the rules in there are a bit difficult to follow, but it's my job to kind of explain those to you and, and to make sure that those rules are abided by as we meet. So. You will, uh, the articles are what's presented in the handout that you have. The actual decisions you make today will be decided by motions. So the motions will be made by the various proponents. So you may see a slight change in the language between what was kind of advertised to you through the articles and what you'll actually be hearing. So the motions are what, what control. Um, in terms of what will happen today, the motions will be made uh, if they're seconded. I will then turn to the proponent to make a brief statement as to a summary as to what the motion is to uh, attempting to accomplish, and then the, the floor will be open for discussion. Um, F, uh, the, the microphones will be portable, so if you do wish to speak, if you could stand, uh, and at some point the microphone will be brought to you, I'll, be, I'll acknowledge you, and at that point if you can just state your name, and if you're comfortable with your street address, uh, so we can all get to know each other a little better, and then we'll proceed with, with your comments. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce, uh, have the head table introduce itself, and we'll start from the far left. Hi, my name's John Pachurik, Sr., and I live at 50 Sugarloaf Street, and I'm on the Finance Committee. John Poreski, I live in Pecumtuck Drive. I'm on the Finance Committee. Julie Chalfont, I live on South Mill River Road. I'm Finance Committee Chair this year. Jeff Upton, Three Hill Crest Ave, uh, Finance Committee and Capital Improvement Committee. Skip Olmstead, I live uh, at 45 Stillwater Road and member of the Finance Committee. Allison Vandervelden, 99 Hillside Road, Finance Committee. Brenda Hill, Town Accountant. <laughs> Barbara Hancock, Treasurer, Collector, Town Clerk. Lisa Mead, Town Council. Deal. Casey Warren, Town Administrator. Dave Wolfram, live on South Main Street here in South yeah, Deerfield. Yeah. I'm the current chair of the board of, uh, Select Board. Trevor McDaniel, Select Board, Board of Health. Carolyn Ness, Select Board, Board of Health. John Pachork, Jr., Chief of Police. Shelley Perita, Business Manager, Frontier and Union 38. Darius Modesto, Superintendent of Schools. 
Tina Jem, principal of Deerfield Elementary School. Zachary Smith, 99 Hillside Road, Chief, South County EMS. <laughs> Kevin Scarborough, 11 West Street, uh, DPW Superintendent. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I do have two initial me, uh, motions. I move that the reading of all articles be waived and that prior to the reading of a motion under the article, the moderator briefly summarize the content of the article to be considered and further that unless objection is raised, the reading of detailed motions be waived where the article as printed can in the opinion of the moderator be incorporated by reference into any motion presented. Seconded. This just basically lets me summarize the, uh, the motion that's before you without having to read the actual uh, text of the uh, article that is in the warrant. So any questions on that? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. We're underway. Uh, I move that the following people be allowed to address the audience during the town meeting. Attorney Lisa Mead, town council. Brenda Hill, town accountant. Casey Warren, Town Administrator, Darius Modesto, Superintendent, Shelley Parita, Director of Business Administration, Frontier Regional, Tina Jemme, Principal Deerfield Elementary School, Richard Martin, Superintendent, Franklin County Tech School, Russell Cobras, Business Manager, Franklin County Tech School. Second. Uh, again, by our town bylaws, uh, non-residents and non-voters, uh, non-residents are not allowed to speak or vote. So this does allow uh, individuals on that list to have relevant information to speak. Is there a second? Uh, I'm sorry, is there any inf uh, questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, the third moderator motion, that the moderator may, in his discretion, call a four-fifths vote without a roll call tabulation. Is there a second? Second. There is a few matter, or there is a matter that requires a fourth-fifth vote today. Uh, technically, we are supposed to uh, tabulate that vote out. Uh, if I can, in my opinion, make that decision by counting manually through the audience, then I would do that with your, with your permission. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, for those of you that uh, attended last year's meeting, we did start to use a consent article. And what the consent articles are meant to do is take some of the quote unquote non-controversial matters and bunch them together into a more concise singular motion. And the goal there obviously is to try to move through it quickly. If there is uh, an item in there that we thought was not controversial or, or individuals did uh, that you do have questions on, uh, at, as they are read, or uh, I'm going to have the letters read, uh, you would just state hold and at that point we'll go back and address that hold before taking the vote so uh, with that mr wolfram i move the town approve article one is set forth in the warrant on the following matters a b c d e f g and h second second mr wolfram do you want to try to summarize briefly there uh, this is a uh, really a housekeeping uh, it we're acknowledging a lot of different uh, pledges and uh, gifts to the town of Deerfield over the uh, last year and, um, and mr. Wolfram uh, in regards to Deerfield Academy item C uh, you had asked the moderator before the meeting if you yeah. could speak briefly as to Deerfield Academy um, at this time I'd like to acknowledge uh, Keith Finan is retiring from the Deerfield Academy and over the last 10 years Keith has been a staunch supporter for the town of Deerfield and he has arranged a lot of different uh, in-kind donations to the town uh, the South County EMS building uh, he's done a lot with the um, the schools school roof it's he's done with our resource officers uh, making sure that we maintain our resource officer uh, and currently they're working with us on uh, upgrading and repairing some of the uh, re things that are happening with the old Deerfield sewer system. So um, in over the last couple years alone, there's been almost $2 million that Deerfield Academy has funneled into the town of Deerfield. And as a private school, they're not bound to do that. You know, if we were in Greenfield and there was that their private school, we'd probably be getting nothing. So uh, Keith has done a wonderful job for the town and I wish to thank him at this time. Thank you. Any
Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Article 2 is also a consent motion. Uh, Mr. McDaniel. I move the town approve Article 2 as set forth in the warrant on the following matters, A, B, and C. Seconded. I'm sorry, there was a hold on B. We'll take a second on the motion. Second. Thank you. Would you like to speak as to your hold? I would. The microphone's coming. Hi, Lily Dwight, South Mill River Road. I believe this bill is for Lascotti developers' non-payment to tie and bond. And under our bylaws, section, uh, hang on, I wrote it all down, 5432, these developers, the applicants, are required to pay the consultants. So I do not understand why we are paying it. This is also upheld in Massachusetts state law. So why are we paying the bill for a developer who is suing us for the second time? Somebody wish to speak to that, or? Do you, do you want a Casey? And then I'm happy to. So the process by which peer review is completed requires that the town actually take the money in from the applicant and pay it out. We are bound to get that money. In other words, we pass an estimate on to the applicant, they send us a check, and we process all bills for that peer review because the town has requested it. In this case, the funds were not obtained before the peer review was completed and the bill was received late. The town is still required to pay because the contract is, is through the town. Mr. Kip, Camosa? Kip, yeah. Kip Camosa. Um, my thoughts on this is that was the bill not paid because of additional work requested by the planning board? Yes. yes. So, in fact, the applicant, and I'm not sticking up for anybody, the applicant paid the bill for the peer review that was presented at the planning board meeting. But the planning board asked for additional work without securing the permission from the applicant. Therefore, I don't know how this is going to end. I don't think the town should pay for it. But if the planning board requested additional information above what the peer review initially required, who's responsible? Town. Town. I can answer that question. You Go ahead. Answer it? Yes. Town council. <laughs> if, if the contract did not include this for the applicant and the planning board asked for additional work without obtaining the funds from the applicant, the town's responsible for paying it. Does that satisfy your hold, Mr. White, or would you like to make an amendment? I guess I am not satisfied because state law upholds our bylaw that says if the board requires a third party review, the applicant pays for it. And this bill is like two years old, correct? Town council? So the member is the member is correct, but the process is required to be followed. And in this instance I'm informed that the process was not followed and therefore the applicant is not required to pay the bill and the town is. Mr. White, uh, at this point, you'd either need to re remove your hold or you'd have to make an amendment. Does the amendment need to be in writing? It does. I have no writing materials. I don't have any. Um, I, I guess I don't. I will remove my hold. Uh, and, and so for future, we have pens and paper up here, so I, I don't want a, an amendment to fail over that issue, so feel free to come up if that's necessary. But at this point, uh, is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, we're going to go back. I'm sorry. So I, I didn't anticipate that. All those in favor?
you're, you're all set. Thank you. No, the head table. I'm sorry. All those opposed? Uh, the motion does not carry. Article 3, Ms. Shores Ness. I move the town approve Article 3 as set forth in the warrant on the following manners A, B, C, and D. Seconded. Ms. Shores Ness, would you like to explain briefly? This is our reserve fund appropriation that the Finance Committee works with every year. It's our OPEB liability trust fund appropriation that we set aside. It's the out of district placement for Smith Folk, and it's the, our contribution for the 350th celebration and, um, that we're anticipating in 2023. Uh, Finance Committee, do you wish to be heard on, on this? We had no significant issues when we had discussion on this. We approved it. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Article 4, Mr. Wolfram. I move the town adopt a classification compensation plan in accordance with the Deerfield General Bylaws, Chapter 35, Personnel, Article 3. Classification Compensation Plan for the Fiscal Year beginning July 1, 2021, as presented in this guide. Seconded. Thank you. Mr. Wolfram, a brief summary? Um, what we've done is uh, we hired a consultant to update uh, a look at our compensation that we're paying uh, the town employees and uh, redid the uh, compensation plan to make it more equitable with hiring people and uh, paying the people that are currently working in town uh, a rate that is uh, compensatory with uh, other uh, towns our size. Finance? Most I'll just pull the mic oh. a little closer. Thank you. Is that better? Yes, yes. much better. Um, so we did review this article and have quite a bit of discussion on it. Most of our discussion actually revolved around the FY23 plan, which is not being voted today. Um, we do recommend approval of this plan. It's the first step towards the FY23 plan. It's a 3% across the board increase, um, plus some targeted equity raises to bring a few people up. Uh, as um, Mr. Wolfram said, uh, equal to market value. Is there anyone here from the personnel board? Just one sec. Yeah, I mean, the personnel board, we met um, over the course of the last few months with the um, woman who did the study, and we support this. It's a two-step plan. This is the first step toward the changes that we feel are needed for the town. Is that a question, a hand up over there? Thank you. I, um, I'm Charlene Galitz, uh, Galinsky. I've lived in the town for 71 years, so I'm very, very aware of how Deerfield has been running over many years. My question is, I watched one of the television shows, and is this the change that the consultant recommended because there were eight or 12 lower positions that were way below the what area towns were compared to and three or four upper positions that were much higher. So they recommended a two-year process. 
is this the first year where they're going to try to, it sounds like from what was uh, explained that they're raising those eight or 12 lower salaries. They're doing nothing with the other salaries. And then next year, they're going to do something else because this was said at the meeting that if we keep the current compens uh, compensation plan, it will not be sustainable for taxpayers in Deerfield. That really was pretty important to hear. So is this that consultant's recommendation that we heard on the television with one of the meetings? That's yes. my question. Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you. The question in the back. So I, I just have a quick question, Eric Phelps, King Philip. Uh, at the very bottom of this listing, there's a salary hourly $14.14. And I understand that the current living wage proposals in the state are $15 an hour. Can we really not get 86 cents an hour for those two positions? Or is that year two that gets us there? Mr. Wolfram? Yes, uh, step two will get us there. This year, what we're doing is a equity adjustment on a, a few of our employees and a 3% across the board increase for all of our employees. And then, next year, we'll and then next year, we'll fully implement this compensation plan if approved by the town. Any other questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Article 5, Mr. McDaniel. I move the moderator read amounts recommended to be appropriated under this article, and unless objection is made, each item recommended in the report of the Finance Committee shall be tentatively accepted as appropriated for the purpose stated. If an objection is made to any recommendation, such appropriation shall be taken separately, and the amount thereof and the manner of taking the same shall be de uh, determined by vote of the meeting and tentatively accepted. One vote shall be taken appropriating each amount so accepted uh, as a single appropriation not to be exceeded. Seconded. Um, so this is our standard budget procedure. Uh, so what's going to happen, uh, the budget line items are, each, uh, are in the packet that's in front of you, and I'm going to read each line item on there. If you don't have an objection to it or a question, then nothing needs to be said. If you do want to come back to it with a question, then I'd ask you to loudly speak and say hold, and then once we've gone through all the line items, we'll come back to those individually, and uh, the board will try to address your questions. Does everyone follow? All those in favor? Opposed? With that, I'll begin reading the omnibus budget. Uh, we're, we're doing the requested, right? Doing the requested. Fiscal year 2020-2022, moderator, 400. Select board salaries, 16,000. Select board staff salaries, 225,167. Select board... Administrator expense, 13100 Finance committee, 500 We have a, a hold on finance committee. Accountant salary, 56358 Accountant expense, 16525 Assessor salaries, 11000 Assessor's administrative assistant, $66,026. Assessor's expense, 23125 Assessor's quinquennial Recertification, $20,000. Clerk, treasurer, collector salaries, $190,517. Treasurer, collector expense, $31,110. Legal expense, $74,000. Personnel board, $500. IT hardware, $5,000. Peg access capital reserve, $4,000. Contracted services, $229,558. Clown, uh, town, town clerk expense, 17598 uh, Open space committee, 1000 Planning board, 10000 uh, I, I apologize. Open space, 10000 Conservation. Uh, conservation, 1000 Is there a hold on open space? 
Planning Board, 7,000. Zoning Board of Appeals, 1,000. Agricultural Commission, 100. Energy Committee, 1,000. Town Office Building Maintenance, 81,100. Town Office Expense, 13,250. General Insurance, $60,000. Public safety, police payroll, 90, 932,657 dollars. Police department expense, 119,300 dollars. Police department cruiser, 55,000 dollars. Hold on, cruiser. Inspector, uh, inspections department payroll, 165,181 dollars. Inspections department expense, 4,750 dollars. Emergency management. $2,800. Canine control, $20,485. Education, Deerfield Elementary School, $4,995,986. Oh. Frontier Regional School, $4,016,567. Frontier Regional Transportation, $122,920. Franklin Technical Assessment, $323,023. Franklin Tech Capital, $17,697. Public Works, General Highway Patrol, uh, Payroll, $543,532. General Highway Expense, $280,050. Winter Snow and Ice Removal, $90,000. Street Lighting, $37,000. Transfer Station Expense, $211,600. Test well monitoring, 40,000. Uh, Human Services, Board of Health salary, $39,336. Board of Health expense, $33,525. Emergency COVID expense, $15,000. Council on Aging, $500. Senior Center expense, $47,558. Veterans District Assessment, $39,000, uh, I'm sorry, $13,910. Veterans Benefits, $21,000. ADA Coordinator, $250. Culture and Recreation, Tilton Library, $194,105. Summer Swim Program, $13,110. I'm sorry, $1,310. Tri-Town Beach Expense, $18,160. There's a hold on Tri-Town. Recreation Department Director Salary, $51,849. Historical Commission, $1,175. Veterans Day Memorial Day Expense, $2,000. Debt Service, Maturing Debt, $483,614. Interest on Maturing Debt, $130,917. Interest on Temporary Loans, $5,000. FERCOG assessment, $41,574. Unfunded sick leave and vacation, $10,000. Franklin County Regional Retirement, $563,504. Workers' compensation, $47,144. Unemployment insurance, $27,000. Group insurance, $292,280. Group insurance school, $657,526. Medicare insurance, $103,987. At this point, we'll go back and start with the holds. And I believe the first hold was on the Finance Committee $500 request. The party making the hold? Yeah, this is Judith Rathbone, 131 North Main Street. I don't have a question specifically about the Finance Committee, but I, I don't understand why there's no line item for the, what I thought was the Committee on Business and Economic Development for this town. If it doesn't appear in the list, should I assume it's not funded or is it within some other category? Would anyone like to address that or? The committee is not paid, I'm told. Are you comfortable removing that hold, Ms. Rathbone? Uh, the Open Space Committee, there was a hold. Ms. 
Dwight. Lily Dwight, South Mill River Road. I just was wondering um, what the huge jump was about. I mean, clearly the Finance Committee approved it, but I'm curious about from $500 to $10,000 is quite a leap. Would somebody from the board like to address that or finance? We're, we're starting um, the op open space plant. Uh, I'm trying. Thank you, Casey. I can't remember. What this, this includes costs to redo our open space and recreation plan. And those costs will be spread over a two-year period. This is the first piece of it. And finance, any comment on it? Or? Sure. Huh? Just to Let's pull that mic this in. This doesn't seem like it's working. Is this working? Yeah. Yes. It does, yeah. OK. Um, just to add to what Casey said, this um, plan is needed when you go out to request grants and other help to the town. So it's uh, definitely a benefit to the town to have the plan upgraded. And the Finance Committee approved this. I remove my hold. Thank you. Thank you. Next hold was on the Police Department Cruiser. Uh, Lou Vincent, Elm Circle. Um, I'm just wondering, it's I'm, my understanding that we are, as a town, purchasing a new police cruiser every year at about $50,000. So I guess I'm wondering, especially in light of some of the other places in town where the expenditure is very low, like the senior center, um, is this a necessary expenditure? How many police vehicles is the town supporting right now? And could there be some commentary on the need to buy a brand new police vehicle each year? Thank you. Would the chief like to speak to that? Or? Sure. Good morning, everybody. John Pachorek, a reminder, 141 Waitley Road, the police chief in Deerfield. So we have five marked cruisers, and we do have two unmarked cruisers. The five marked cars are rotated one a year. And that mileage adds up when you take two people on duty 24-7 and really divide the mileage out over 365 days. We averagely burn out about one car a year. That mileage totals between 144 to about 165,000 miles depending on how busy the call volume is for that specific year. And when you do it, you have to look at all five cars. So basically, we really use up about one car a year with the caveat that if that outgoing car is in decent shape, it is then held over for six to 12 months on details, as you've seen on five and 10 recently. So every day that you see that cruiser out there, we are charging the detail company $10 an hour and all that money goes back to the town. It does not come to the police department. By mass general law, it has to go into the town general fund. So all that money does cycle back. The cruisers in my 27 and a half year career have skyrocketed. I remember buying Crown Victorias for $17,000. Now we purchased the Ford Utility Hybrid Cruisers, which are eco-friendly. They're amazing on gas. Our gas mileage we're showing on the current two models has gone up from about eight miles to the gallon to 24. So it is an additional investment. It was quite a jump about two years ago when we first did this. I believe the price difference right off the stickers about seven or $8,000 more. The goal on the flip side of the five years in hopes is that the gas mileage will be reduced by 10 to 15,000 and yet our wear and tear on the world will be re reduced dramatically. So we do have the five mark cars, and we do burn up about one a year. Finance, any comment? No comment. You comfortable removing your hold, ma'am? I'll remove my hold. Thank Thanks. you. The Deerfield Elementary School budget. Uh, good morning, Darius Modesto, superintendent. Not every day do you get to hold your own budget. Um, but you might, you might be pleased to hear this. So when we developed this budget, um, this has been a very, as you know, trying year for the schools. Um, we had a lot of influx of money from the federal government that we weren't expecting. We, we had freeze, frozen our budgets um, last spring and then we're very conservative because we were all concerned about what the pandemic was going to bring for funding. And so we kind of hunkered down within our finances. Um, and as you remember last year, we came forward with a 0% increase in our budget and in, in, in also looking at the town. In doing so, we, we put aside $90,000 for um, this year's budget from savings. In the past few weeks, um, we've, you know, we're reconciling our books and getting them ready to close them for the year. And we've 
I want to say we realized, we, we've estimated we, were con we weren't conservative enough. No, we were over-conservative. Um, and so on Tuesday, the school committee voted to reduce the budget by $50,000. So I'd like to change the line item um, to change our budget from a 3.35 increase to a 2.32 with the overall um, amount of $4,945,986. And if I have to have that in writing, I have that here. So I'd like to reduce the budget by $50,000 to do the savings. Is there a second? Seconded. Seconded. <laughs> Nobody wants to fight for that? <laughs> uh, all those in favor of the amendment as presented? Opposed? That amendment carries. Tritown Beach. There was a hold on Tritown. Mrs. Paturik. Good morning. Good morning. Sharon Paturik, 50 Sugarloaf Street. It's my understanding Tritown Beach is closed and there is no swim program. Do we have to continue funding this at this point? Somebody from the board? Mr. McDaniel. Yes, we, we um, this year, this year, because of COVID, they are closing, but they're, what they're planning to do, we're hoping to add, uh, we've had two, two people from the board from Deerfield, representing Deerfield, step down, just they serve their time and want to move on. We're, we have put out a request to have three people join that board, and we also plan to take um, the funding that we would normally fund this year, uh, and they're going to do improvements to the place and get it ready for next year. And our budget, you know, you you'd think, well, why don't we just fund it next year? We need the money because, you know, summer starts before we get to June 30th. So there'll be programs that'll kind of start the beginning of next year. Uh, so we, we're going to use the money to kind of revamp Tritown and, and work with Waitley to, to reinvent that place and, and make it a good, a good place for our families. Thank you. I remove my hold. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Rathbone. I just wanted to add a little commentary uh, on, on the beach. You could ask me to serve. I would be happy to, and I'd be happy to lead a small fundraising effort for supplementary monies because my family always um, loved the beach. And I'm very concerned about it being closed this year because of what happened last year where so many people went to the Deerfield River to swim that the police were posted and it just and it was seemed like a shocking amount of time spent monitoring people we know there are concerns from the neighbors at the Deerfield River entrance about trash and uh, parking and drinking. I assume we're going to have the same thing this year and one of the reasons I'm such a strong advocate for the uh, Tritown Beach is that we have had people drown in the Deerfield River because it's not really meant for swimming and there has to be extreme caution. And so on a, from a financial point of view, it makes sense to fund the Tritown Beach and get people over there with no one taking chances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question on that. Um, this is Erica Higgins Ross, 22 <laughs> Greeno Crossing. I'm over here. Uh, is there a chance that with the changing um, rules and statewide rules that Tritown will be open, or is that a, a no go? It, Mr. McDaniel? It is really up to the board, I believe, that, that uh, monitors that and set, sets the plan. And right now, Deerfield has no um, representation. So I think if we get a few people on the board and they get get meeting with Waitley. I know Waitley is anxious to get moving on this too. I, I've talked with John um, John Edwards, the select board in, in uh, Waitley the other day on this matter and um, he's really excited to invigorate the place. So there, there is a possibility. I, I wouldn't want to speak for that board but once we get some representation I have had um, a lot of people have interest. I've asked for those letters to come to the select board so we could pick the right mix of people to represent Deerfield. Any other questions? Okay. Mr. McDaniel. I move the town appropriate 15,905,000 uh, 
$905,706 to fund the accepted amounts voted and to meet this appropriation, transfer $62,530 from the SCEMS Enterprise Fund, $5,649 from the South County Senior Center Fund, $38,620 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund, $6,088 uh, from receipts uh, reserved for debt and $8,997 from free cash and raise and appropriate. I didn't read that number. Last number. 33. What was that again? 15 million 733. No, Fif that one. no. This no. one here. 15 million. Uh, this one here. Mm -hmm. right there. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> 15 million dollars. Oh, is this? I thought this was the new one. With the changes in the budget we just made, I just got to make sure I got the right number. We took less out of free cash. We took less out of free cash. Okay, so it is the same number then. Yeah, it's just fifty here, fifty there. Right. Yep. Fifteen million seven hundred eighty-three thousand and twenty-nine dollars. And I second it. Thank you. All those. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Opposed. We have a budget. Article 6. Ms. Shores Ness. I, <coughs> excuse me. I move the town vote to appropriate $1,542,940 for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2021 to fund the sewer Wastewater Treatment Plant Enterprise Fund as set forth in the warrant. Second. Ms. Shores Neff, if you could briefly summarize. This is the standalone fund that comes, um, that covers the operations for both of our sewer treatment plants and, um, and therefore is covered by the sewer um, Thank you. Finance Committee, any comment? Not really. We reviewed this, we reviewed this with the department head. I don't think the mic's on. Yep. We reviewed this with the department head and approved it. There's no questions or comments. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Judith Rathbone. I, did we get our sewer and water bills yet for this year? I feel like I haven't seen mine. Someone comment on the timing of the year? Um, I just got my water bill, <laughs> so they're coming. They are a little late. And um, the sewer bills will follow probably the end of next week. They'll go out. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Wolfram. I move the town vote to appropriate the sum of $1,432,844 and to transfer from free cash the sum of $309,243 to, to fund the South County Emergency Medical Services Enterprise Fund for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2021, as set forth in the warrant. Second. Mr. Wolfram, if you could summarize. Um, this is uh, basically to fund the uh, excellent service that we now have for the uh, uh, servicing the three towns. And it's a breakdown of the expenses and the uh, the reimbursements that the uh, uh, EMS does get. It's uh, and the Deerfield share uh, is outlined in the uh, handout. Finance, Julie, is that mic working? Is it? Yes. 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 Look at that. Um, Again, we reviewed this with the department head. We didn't have any significant um, issues with it, and the finance committee approved. Any questions? Ms. Rathbone. I work as a crisis clinician for a CSO, which holds the contract for emergency services for people who have mental health issues or are suicidal. 
Um, I know that recently the police uh, in several of the towns incorporated the use of a clinician for police calls, but I just wanted clarity on whether that also applies to the EMS calls, if there is any uh, use of those social work services for mental health calls, or if it's solely done through the police. Thank you. Chief? Sure. Yep. So I'm sure Zach will agree that when a call comes in, if the crisis worker is available, the police are dispatched to all medicals. So that crisis worker does respond out and try and intervene on scene. Uh, most realize that society is moving towards home care. We actually like those crisis workers on scene and try and intervene as fast as possible to get them intervention. Uh, we don't want to send them to the hospital unless we absolutely have to. And if it's a situation that we can resolve at home, we certainly try to work that out with uh, the police officers and uh, paramedics present. Uh, I just want to add that we have been interacting and utilizing the CSO services recently. They've been in incredibly helpful and we're thankful to have them um, as part of a resource through the chief of police and, and the DA's office. Uh, the reason, um, just a little bit of background, we're governed by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and they've been moving very slowly as terms of the regulations go. So right now, actually, to provide the best care for our citizens, it is to embed those crisis uh, professionals with the police department. They can actually, they have more leeway to give the individual the services they need. Once the ambulance gets on scene, the regulations are very clear that we don't have the same breadth of options. So that's why those people are embedded with the police department right now and not with the EMS. But um, we're really thankful to have them. It's, it's reduced um, the things that we've had to do um, or, uh, and, and increased outcomes positively for the citizens already. So thank you. Mr. Camosa. Kip Camosa, Greenfield Road. I was wondering if someone could briefly explain the retained earnings. <coughs> so retained earnings, uh, as an enterprise fund, when we fund South County EMS, all of the money that we collect through insurance billing comes back to the enterprise fund. And this is part of the reason why we're able to account for all of our associated expenses, including benefits, OPEB, things like that. The retained earnings are basically revenue that we received above our estimation. So for FY22, um, I've estimated that we will receive $525,000 uh, toward from medical billing through DA hiring an ambulance as a standby for their commencement, things like that. Any money that we receive above that, so say we receive 600000 that additional money goes back to the enterprise fund, and then the following year, it gets applied towards the next year's budget. Um, and that's how we can actually maintain a level budget from year to year. We can absorb things like COVID without having our expenses jump all the way up, all the way down. It evens out over time. The other nice thing about that too is that retained earnings represents the money that we put aside for capital investment. So right now we have to replace an ambulance because of wear and tear and regulations every four to six years or so. We have a fleet of three ambulances. So each ambulance um, lasts in that fleet for about 12 years. Um, and with retained earnings, we shave off a little bit of that revenue that we received. We put it aside until we have enough to buy the new ambulance. So we don't have to come to town meeting and appropriate that money above and beyond. But because of the nature of the enterprise fund, that's one big chunk of money in an account. So we actually have to kind of keep tabs of it separately. But that money will continue to grow every single year until I have the um, half a million dollars I need for a new ambulance and then we'll spend it down. So it's, it, it's not as pretty as I would like it to be, um, but this isn't an example of us not spending all of our money. It's an example of us being fiscally responsible and, and trying to do those capital things, uh, fund them over time. I, the, the reason I ask that is over the years, the retained earnings has been go going down, but it's basically money that's I don't want to use the term left over because Zach gave a good explanation. But every year we fund this, and the retained earnings are from three to five hundred thousand dollars. And yet, you're requesting another hundred thousand dollars for un ex unforeseen expenses. It seems to me that, with a seven-year track history, that the organization should be able to keep better track of the money and not tax us as much. 
Just yeah, my thought. Sure. That, that $100,000, uh, we've been doing that for a number of years. That is money that we put aside in case something like a global pandemic happens and we didn't account for it. Uh, I, what's interesting is our call volume went down because people didn't want to go to the hospital. Um, so our revenue went down, but our expenses went up in not just additional personal protective equipment, but we all remember how much face masks were going for, $10 a piece where they were cents before. So we were able to weather COVID financially because of that line item. And because we're an enterprise fund, if we don't spend that money, it goes right back into the, the next year. So it's listed here as a separate for transparency. Everybody knows it. But ostensibly, that money is being funded from the previous year's $100,000 that we didn't spend. So it's on the books, but um, it's just carried over, and it's not an expense to the, to the people. There was a qu question in front. First of all, I wanted to thank you. Oh, Annette Fanna Becker, Baker Lane. I just wanted to thank you for adding the clinician. It, it feels um, very important, and I'm glad it ju you just did it. Um, also, I, I just was curious on where the funding comes from for the clinician, uh, clinician out of, just for information's sake. Is it the Board of Health? Is it, um, it's not your budget, is it? Uh, it's not, you can thank John Pachurik for making that clinician happen, so I'll have him speak to that. Sure, so that's a partnership with CSO right now. It's being funded through CSO, and we're also applying for grants through the Department of Public Health <coughs> to hopefully enhance that single position into two or three positions. And in the next year, we've already got uh, requests from additional communities across Franklin County to add each and every community. So it's gonna be interesting. What I would ask the townspeople support for is as we bring this person around and respond to emergencies, it's gonna be weird because you are gonna see a Deerfield cruiser in Montague and Greenfield if they're on duty for Deerfield. At certain points in time, as we expand it, if there's a jumper on the French King Bridge and they're on duty with a Deerfield officer, you actually may see the Deerfield cruiser flying up to the French King Bridge to try and intervene in that crisis. So it's going to take some flexibility. It's, uh, I'm sure, sure I'm going to get some questions as we roll the program out and get more and more extensive. Right now, CSO truly believed in the partnership and saw the better outcome by putting people in the field and it's almost a shift of resources mm -hmm. we're going to build on that shift of resources to get more great thank you and thank you for your fiscal responsibility <laughs> you're welcome any other questions on the scams enterprise fund all those in favor opposed the motion carries Article 8, Mr. McDaniel. I move the town appro uh, approve, let's see, I move the town approve the town uh, and move the town transfer. This was not spelled right. <laughs> Sorry. I move the town, <laughs> move the town uh, transfer 179000 from free cash, transfer 26000 from the roadside mower special revenue fund, transfer $52,108 $118 from the Municipal Building Fund, transfer $150,000 from the Capital Stabilization Fund, and transfer $55,000 from the SCEMS Rent Stabilization to fund the capital improvement projects for the fiscal year beginning uh, July 1st, 2021. Second. Second. Mr. McDaniel? Yeah, so, um, so we, have, uh, we have several capital projects that we're going to tackle this year, and this has been a, a lot of work. I want to thank the Finance Committee, the Select Board, the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. On We, we worked on this really hard, trying to figure out what we would have for money this year to do these different projects. Um, one we have from free, we've kind of broke this out from free cash, you know, different, different pockets of money to kind of fund these projects. And... Um, I'm happy to answer any of them. They're all listed there. So if anyone has any questions, and, and I know Darius has some other great news. Mr. Modesto. <laughs> yes. grab, grab it. So there's many years where the schools are doing all the asking. Um, but this year, once again, um, with the savings that we've had this year, the school committee on Tuesday voted to remove withdraw the capital request of $36,500, and we'll be paying these for these projects out of reserve funds. Um, 
Frontier also did the same, but they were able to make the warrant, so they withdrew their capital request as well through the savings that they had at Frontier. Um, it will be using um, E and D um, from the previous year to pay for those expenses as well. So that's that, the cost of thirty-six thousand five hundred dollars. I'd like to remove, um, and I apologize because I know that this causes. Um, it's not, not the way to do business, and this has been a very off year. I mean, we put together our capital request in December, and a lot has changed. We didn't know what the financial outcome, we didn't know if there was going to be a budget um, from the state in time um, coming right. through that process. So um, we had no idea where things were going, and so we, you know, we were conservative all the way through. So and I, I apologize to those people who put out capital requests, and then we took some of their money, so to speak, interdepartmentally. Um, but um, since we can pay for it, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, anytime you want to ask for less money, we'll deal with the inconvenience. So, so the, there's a motion to uh, amend. Uh, if we can just get through the, mo I think at this point there's a motion been made. So we just need a second. Seconded. And at this point, it would be open to question. Ms. Rathbone. Question on what uh, Mr. Modesto said. It is. Okay, is just then I'll wait. I have yep. general. So there has been a request to remove uh, the first two line items, essentially the 21-2 and the 15-3. Is there any discussion on that amendment only? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion carries. So we're back to the main motion as amended. Any questions on that? Ms. Rathbone. Okay, I, I hate to tackle this issue of sidewalks alone, so if there's anybody else here who wants to weigh in, please think about standing up. I understand from this, the way I read it, is that 100,000 is budgeted, 150,000 is budgeted, so 250,000 is budgeted to do repairs. No one would be against that especially those of us who have almost tripped many, many times. Um, but I would like a plan. Is there a public plan? So that's my question. And then I see 25000 for paving. Is that this issue of the new sidewalks? And I would like to see a public plan for the new sidewalks. I know I was at a committee Zoom where they said they were debating where to go with their priorities. But I, I would like to have information about that so I can see. I think it's reasonable for us to know where the sidewalks are being repaired and where new ones are being put in. At some point, I'd like to pin the committees down so they put this information on and we can just easily look and see. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel? So it's not an easy subject, right? There's, there's a, an immense amount of work that needs to happen. The request was a little over a half a million dollars for sidewalk work, and we didn't think we had the money this year to tackle all of it. We had uh, put together just a rough you know, estimate, what would it take to, to start doing the sidewalks, and that's kind of where we came up with the 500,000. That's not for every sidewalk in town, certainly Sugarloaf Street is, again, state-owned, so we don't have access to that. But we want to start doing from kind of the center of the town south, um, or excuse me, north and, and south uh, to start working on those. There's a few in Old Deerfield where the sidewalks are actually missing. You know, you just they stop halfway. And uh, so there, there's a lot of work to do, and, and really we wanted to see if the um, – if the town would would allow us to start putting some of this money we took uh, 150 from our capital stabilization account which we were trying to build that up bigger but we we didn't want to go ask for more taxation where we did have some stabilization set aside so we pulled some from free cash some from capital stabilization to at least get started on on half of the work and and i don't i don't have a plan exactly which sidewalk's going to happen and what you know there'll be a mixture of asphalt and concrete, um, we'll mostly do concrete around the center of town, asphalt where you can stretch it out, it's a whole lot less money. So there'll be, um, w what we'll first start with was probably North and South Main Street. Um, but we first have to see if we have the money and how far that'll stretch. Of course, when you get to an intersection, there'll be ADA compliant work that'll get done with some concrete around there and obviously all the stuff that's required with, um, with ADA compatibility. And next year we'll come back for more, for sure. Just keep keep going on this. It's the, it's the number one thing we're asked for, is sidewalks. Believe it or not. 
Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Um, you. Does the Capital Improvement Committee wish to be heard and then finance? Finance then? Capital oh, Mr. Upton. I, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I can. I can speak for Capital. I guess because I do sit on the Capital Committee. But uh, yes, we we agreed that uh, the sidewalks something needs to be done that uh, we were hoping to build the capital stabilization fund even uh, more but uh, with with what we we're facing this year as far as monies we weren't able to afford to do that and this is the first year just a forewarning this is the first year that we took money out of the capital stabilization fund to pay for something and we realized that a lot of people sidewalks feel it's very important so 150,000 came out of that capital, capital stabilization fund, uh, which obviously lowers the dollar amount. And we have some uh, several big ticket items coming up in the near future. So I just want to forewarn people uh, about your tax rates. And the Capital Improvement Committee did uh, approve this. Did you wish to speak further? Yeah, right. There's a mic coming right to you. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Judy Holmes, 32 um, Snowberry Circle. Uh, I'd like to go back to the sidewalks on Sugarloaf, and I understand that Sugarloaf Street is a town, uh, it's a state owned road that we would have to get the town, the state to cooperate with us on. And I look to the wonderful work that the uh, select board did, particularly um, uh, the select board in getting the uh, parking lot at the base of Sugarloaf paved, which required cooperation from three separate entities. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any process in motion to try to get that kind of cooperation, because the Sugarloaf sidewalks are a, a disgrace. Ms. Schwarzenegger? Um, we've been meeting with DOT, and we've had some really productive meetings. And uh, one of the things that was achieved is um, an agreement that they would turn over uh, Sugarloaf Street to us once everything was upgraded. It is in the transportation bill that the infrastructure, the drainage, as well as the pavement and the sidewalks are, are in the transportation bond bill that passed. And we're going through the state um, you know, bidding process and um, you know the whole... I, I would still say that we have like three years waiting, but we've been working on this for years. We've had productive meetings with DOT. They've been wonderfully cooperative. Uh, Kevin, John, Trevor and I have been down there multiple times to talk with them. They've worked with us um, and we're hoping that we can move forward um, and we'll keep chug chugging along. We keep reminding them, don't worry, we're persistent. They know who we are, and they have been meeting with us. But you know, you have to go through the state system. And one of the things to do was to appropriate money. So the money was appropriated. Everyone voted for it statewide. Um, we had good um, support, and the legislature supported it. And it is moving forward. I don't know if the bid documents have actually been done yet. Um, we've been so busy with COVID that truthfully we haven't, I have not yeah. followed up on it lately, but it is coming. And so we should have, um, um, see the bid documents and um, who they awarded the bids to. And then it's a process of just getting it started. Uh, I just, if finance can speak briefly, then we'll get to the. Um, is this working? No. Yes. Yep. Yes. Now it is. Okay. Um, first. Just very quickly, the asphalt paving line item is actually asphalt paving around the South County EMS building. It's not sidewalks. Um, but to, I just wanted to quickly make the financial committee um, statement on this lawn item. First is a congratulations to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee who did a fantastic job of prioritizing the needs for the town and presenting that to the group so that we could have a good discussion on it. Um, in order to fund these capital projects that are on here, um, we took from free cash and we brought free cash down to $193,000. Um, we typically like to have $500,000 um, transferred year to year. We did that for years. The past couple of years, that's come down to $300,000, $250,000, and then this year we were at $193,000. Um, the help that the schools just gave us is bringing us back up to about the $250,000 
value, maybe a little more than that, um, which is much more comfortable than 193. I also want to point out that we tapped the municipal building fund, which was some funds left over from a previous project that were in essentially a savings account that the town had. We are going to spend that on upgrading municipal buildings, which is what is it intended for. But just to point out that that's funding that we won't have next year because we will have spent it for what it was needed this year. Um, we are also, as has been commented a couple times, using funds from the capital stabilization fund um, instead of our goal of building it up. Um, so we are doing some things because we think the projects are important, but there is definite concern about the sustainability of plans going forward um, because there's a lot on our plate that we have a lot of momentum built up to do. There's the library and the um, sidewalks and the sewer, and the, there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, we are definitely concerned about being able to fund that, though, and keeping our tax rates normal. Um, with that, we did approve this list of capital projects. Thank you. There were some hands. What, Mr. Camosa? Thank you. First of all, for clarity, did I understand Ms. Ness right when she said that state was going to turn Sugarloaf Street over to the town? Ms. Shores Ness? Yes. We're, we are in the process of working with them to have the state um, give us uh, Sugarloaf Street, but we do not want to take it over until it's 100% um, upgraded and improved. I don't think that that's a wise move. I mean, the sidewalks definitely need to be replaced. But once that town accepts that road, our children and grandchildren are going to be responsible for paving it, maintaining it forever and always. Um, I know it's been difficult to get the state to act, but I would think that it's best to let the state maintain the ownership and maintenance of that road. Uh, my next question is, I'd like to uh, ask about the needs and feasibility study for the Senior Center for $42,500. Is there someone who could address that? Casey, you or me? Ms. Warren. Oh, I don't mind. <laughs> no, Ms. Warren. <laughs> So the Senior Needs and Feasibility Study is a two-part project. The first piece of it is to <clears throat> develop an idea of what seniors need for services. In other words, survey them to see what they would like to see for services. And keep in mind, these are three towns we participate in a regional senior center. The second part, the feasibility piece of it, is to determine based on that survey how to provide those services to seniors effectively and efficiently, and how we use the spaces that we have to do that. So that is not um, part of the building needs an assessment. It's just the services rendered to the seniors? Correct. Correct. It's partially the services rendered to the seniors, and then some idea of how we would utilize the building or buildings to provide them but not the actual repair or maintenance or reconstruction of the existing center? No. 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 Okay. Um, my next question is at the, um, the asphalt paving. Can someone address what's the size of the parking area that's going to be created? Do you want to go to the yeah, So this is for the South County EMS building. When that was uh, very generously gifted to us by Deerfield Academy, they built the building and a small ramp out front. Currently, in order for us to back the ambulances in, uh, we often have to drive onto the lawn. It's just the asphalt is a little bit too short for the length of the ambulance and its turning radius. So this would extend that about 10 feet, give us just a little bit more room there. And then also, we don't have our own parking area. We, we currently, uh, South Deerfield Fire is very gracious. They allow us to park um, in their lot adjacent to the helipad. So we usually have to scramble and move our vehicles if we're not on the call when the helicopter lands. Um, this paving would also include a small staff parking area just to the north of our building, just around the corner, it would facilitate with snow removal as well. And it would allow us to also create uh, that extra 10 feet, a visitor parking spot uh, in front of our building, clearly marked. So when people come to our building, either vendors or visitors or even patients, sometimes they're not blocking an ambulance. Right. Thank you. Well, giving that building where the ambulances are is about 36 feet long and Zach's determination is going to add 10 feet. Uh, that's already, um, you know, pretty big. And then the parking for the cars. 
later on in this meeting, we're going to address. If we um, can just stick to this article. We, we, we are. This is exactly yeah. what it is. You're, the $25,000 is not going to be anywhere near enough money because you're going to have to go through site plan review if these articles pass. And with site plan review, with between the engineers and consultants, you're going to have to double that amount to $50,000 at least. Okay. Thank but, you. Uh, 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 I'm going to move on to some other questions. We can come back if you still have some. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, in the front row? We get a mic. No? Thanks. Okay. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm Erica Franks. I live at 40 Thayer, and I walk every day. I have for the last year and a half, barring about three days, we had that heat advisory. Um, if you're going to talk about Sugarloaf and the town in general, would you think about there's really only one crosswalk in the town that the drivers routinely notice if there's somebody trying to cross, and that's in front of the post office. A lot of the other ones, you can't even hardly see the lines. That would be nice for this year. But I wish you'd consider for next year thinking about um, up on Montague City Road at near the, um, the Canal Trail. They have this beautiful setup where you push a button, the yellow lights start flashing for the people to cross the street. Sometimes Sugarloaf is that busy. And also at the four-way stop, I've had this little gripe for a long time. I don't think it's marked well enough, or maybe it needs a light, but I think a lot of people think it's a two-way stop, and they just kind of they don't see the other side, or they tend to just follow the car in front of them. I, I, it's just not safe, and there's a lot more traffic, I think, than you know there were two years, three years ago when I moved here. That's all I wanted to say. If you're making plans. Thank you. Thank you. Good input. Thank you. Ms. Rothbaum. Thank you, dear. Uh, back to the senior center needs assessment. I is this funded equally by all the other towns, the other two towns, or are we paying for the entire thing? Ms. Warren. This is funded, yes, by all three towns. The each town pays a different pays a percentage. Deerfield pays 50%, Sunderland pays 25, and Waitley pays 25. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Camosa? Just so you can hear. Um, also, the exhaust system that's requ uh, requested, I believe that's for uh, en an engine emissions uh, exhaust system in the EMS building. Zach? Uh, y yes, and uh, do you, <laughs> Kevin wants to answer it, actually. Sure. The exhaust system, what it does is it attaches to the ambulance when it's driving in and uh, backing, backing in and driving out, automatically discharges as they leave. It is an OSHA requirement. There are people living there 24-7, 365, and again, it's, it's a requirement. I also like to keep in the back of mind, everybody, that the paving and the exhaust system is not physically coming from your pocket. It is being utilized and paid for by the rent stabilization fund. So this is actually not coming from your pocket now. This is from all of the things that South County EMS has collected for monies. So again, uh, South County EMS does pay 36000 $36,000 a year to the town of Deerfield for rent. That in turn, the town maintains the building itself. So again, with, with the paving and the exhaust system, both of those are paid for by, uh, not by tax money per se. And I just, while we're right real quick, as you're talking about the anything on Sugarloaf Street, whether it be striping, whether it be adding anything to the side, all of that has to be approved by District 2 because that is a, a state-owned property. Um, and the last one I'd like to hit real quick because nobody's talked about it yet is the roadside mower. Um, this is our fifth payment and our final payment. The monies, once again, do not come from taxpayer money. It comes from Eversource. Eversource has a uh, program that for five years they give up $26,000 and we go ahead and they give us the machine. After we share this machine with five other towns for five years. This is our final year of sharing from here on out. It is one, our machine 100%. Thank you. So if you're saying that was a requirement of OSHA, we're 
When did they change that requirement? It was not required two years ago when they built it. That is correct, but we're also, two years ago, municipalities were not underneath OSHA. We are now. Okay, thank you. I, just to tack on, I, aside from it being a requirement, diesel exhaust fumes are known carcinogens, and we have people who occupy that building 24-7, um, and studies have shown time and time again that prolonged exposure to diesel exhaust fumes can cause cancer. Additionally, we don't have any storage in that building. All of our medical equipment storage is in the garage bay, and that is also being covered in diesel particulate exhaust. Um, so this is standard practice for public safety facilities, any facilities where people are residing 24-7. Again, it is paid out of the rent money um, that we paid from collections from revenue of billing and the other member towns. So. Yes. Hi, Kate Lawless, 11 Sugarloaf Street. I'd like to echo support that this lady um, said about calming traffic down on Sugarloaf. Um, I think those crosswalks would be great. And I know this is not exactly what the warrant item is, but I just want to throw that out there that people drive too fast on Sugarloaf is my opinion, and that we should slow it down, get some more traffic controls at the four-way stop, perhaps a light. I also support that. And then I just want to put a plug in for the common plan. If we do get that uh, common a little more yeah. accessible for pedestrians, we're really going to want to make sure that traffic is calm and safe. Great. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to see. Are there any other questions before I take that? I think we're ready. So we'll skip over the call, but I appreciate it. We'll go right to the vote. All those in favor? Dan, there needs to be an adjustment for the $36,000. Yes, yeah, the vote, uh, I believe it's been amended, but the, the vote is on a total, um, uh, the amended amount after Mr. Modesto's removal was $425,618. Um, that, That's good for your point. Yeah, we're, we're, we're good, we're I appreciate good. it. No, Brenda, where's it coming from? The free cash. Free cash. Town. So we need to reduce free cash. To yeah. 142, 142 5, 142, 5, 140, what is it? 142.5 is what's Thank coming you. out of free cash. Yeah. <laughs> 126, 126, 126. And do we, do we need an amendment in reference to free cash reference? Or I, I think we're fine. So all those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries by two thirds. Do we have to take a separate vote on uh, these? I'm going to just take a sec. We, we have a tremendous amount of ground to cover today, um, and my job is to try to keep things on track. So I'm going to ask both the head table and, and uh, the town members if the questions can be directed here, and then I'll direct them to where we're going over here, and if we can keep our comments as, as kind of relevant and brief. Uh, we really do want to try to get through all this today for all of us, and um, we have a lot to do. So just wanted to put that out there. So Article 9, Ms. Shores Ness. I move the town... Uh, act on the recommendations of the Community Preservation Committee for fiscal year two, 2022 Community Preservation Fund budget with each item to be considered as a separate appropriation as presented in this guide. A, appropriate $4,475 from the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues for the clearing of a 0.48 acre uh, town of Deerfield site of the original Pine Nook Cemetery, surveying the site, pro probing for toppled and buried gravestones, repairing, re-erecting, stabilizing, and cleaning the 200-year-old year gravestones, all in a manner consistent with the proposal submitted by the Deerfield Historic Commission and approved by the Community Preservation Committee, said funds to be expended within three years under the direction of the select board and any unused funds to be returned to the Community Preservation Fund as required by statute. And B, appropriate $13,000 from the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues for Agricultural Preservation Restriction, APR, match for the property identified in the assessor's records as map 148, lot 7, 
all in a con manner consistent with the proposal submitted by the Town of Deerfield Select Board and approved by the Community Preservation Committee, said funds to be expended within three years under the direction of the Select Board and any unused funds to be returned to the Community Preservation Fund as required by statute. <coughs> and C, transfer $209,000, about 55% of the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues to the reserve for the community housing. General Law Chapter 44B requires that a minimum of 10% be set aside for community housing. And D, transfer 25,000, which is a roughly 10% of the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues to the reserve for open space as required by General Law Chapter 44B and E, transfer $33,525, again, about 25, I mean, 10% of the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues to the reserve for historic preservation as required by General Law Chapter 44B. And F, appropriate 15,000 from the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues for the Community Preservation Committee administrative expenses and G, transfer 80,000, the balance of the Community Preservation Fund 2022 estimated revenues to the Community Pres Preservation Budgeted Reserve. Second. Mr. Resnats, do you want to try to summarize or how would you like to approach it? <laughs> I, I, this is just um, the Community Preservation Fund. I'd like to see if um, the chair would want to talk to that. Mr. Hilchey, we'll get you a mic. Tim Hilchey, Greenfield Road, Chairman of the Community Preservation Committee. So the first, p the first um, item is a historically important um, cemetery that has, as it says, 200-year-old graves uh, that have been discovered by um, some members of the, the community. Is Chris Harris here? Do you, um, you want to add anything to this? Okay, good. Keeping it short. Uh, the second one is uh, $13,000 that's going to allow the town to match a state grant to preserve um, 7.4 acres of this really prime farmland in perpetuity. And uh, so the third item, which um, some people may have questions about, community housing, including senior affordable housing and low-income affordable housing, is a priority that's been expressed in town for a long time. Uh, it's also very expensive to do. And since the, the town has been very generous about supporting historical preservation and also um, you know, community recreation projects, this is the one item that we are required by state law and which is under the purview of the Community Preservation Act to, to support. So we felt that this year we'd like to try to build up the fund that's reserved specifically for that to provide impetus to help the town meet some of its uh, affordable housing goals. And um, I don't have anything else to, to add, but I appreciate the Finance Committee's support for this. And uh, thank you. And Mr. Hilchey, is it correct that the other amounts are just essentially the statutory minimums that you're funding? Yes, you'll see that one. there's one variation in D. That's because 13,000 of the estimated revenues that we'll receive um, is being put forward to handle the APR match. And the, the other amount is, is it, these are required statutorily under, if we didn't allocate, we have to allocate 10% to th these three categories and then the rest of the fund would normally go into the general reserve fund to be expended. Great, thank you. The Finance Committee. Oops, sorry, let's go for you. The Finance Committee did approve this item. Um, the discussion revolved around the 55% um, set aside for the housing. The minimum required by law is only 10%, so this is a decision to set aside extra money for community housing. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about whether that had gone through enough discussion, but in the end, um, this item was approved by the Finance Committee. Any questions? Yes, get your mic.
Uh, Bernie Sadowski, 307 River Road. I have a question. Is this uh, the cemetery across from Keith Crossing? Is that the cemetery we were talking about? Mr. Hilchey, you can give it a shout. Yeah. It is. Um, Chris Harris would speak better to it because he's actually bit as. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, and the second question is, do, do you need a right of way to get onto that property since it does cross over personal, pro uh, not town-owned land? You we have, that, we right? have that from the property owner. Thank you. Questions answered. Thank you. Any other questions? Quick question. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on C, with the 55% going for uh, the community housing, uh, what qualifies for the distribution of funds? And I guess what I'm looking for is that are we discussing the uh, affordab affordable housing? Does that mean that at some point in time we'll be voting to uh, supplement somebody's rent or mortgage to keep them in their house? And just the question. Yep. I'm going to defer to town council on this, Mr. Ilchi, if that's okay. Yeah. And you can also. No, please. <laughs> and any further appropriation from this fund would have to come back to town meeting. Correct. I understand that. Right, I, I do understand that, but what I'm looking for is what would be uh, allowable to be considered for appropriated funds. As I said, would supplementing somebody's rent or mortgage qualify for this money? Only if there was an affordable housing restriction placed on the property. Okay, thank you. I have a question to you, actually. Yes, in the front, I'm sorry. Bob Decker, the question I have is the reserve fund for community preservation housing. What is the balance now, and what will the balance be uh, once you transfer this two hundred nine thousand? I believe that's listed. Yeah, three hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, the three hundred fifty thousand four hundred fifty-five dollars. So it'll it'll be that much plus the two hundred nine. Yes. Correct. Okay, now can 40B housing, uh, can that be used for 40B housing? Attorney Mead? Only in cooperation with the town and a, an appropriation from this body. So the answer is yes, but it has to come back here to, to do that. So that That's correct. So if somebody wants to build a, a 40B housing project, uh, they could by coming to the town and saying, we need, we need some money to help us make this thing work. They could do it without coming to the town. They can do it without coming Not to the, the town, money, but the they have to uh, right. have enough money to do it. That, that's correct. They couldn't, they couldn't do it with this money without coming to the town, but anybody can file for a comprehensive permit. A comprehensive permit, but they can also get the town to supplement their project. That's my point. That's correct, by coming that's, to the that's town. That's been answered, yes, thank you. Any other, any other questions? I have a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, this is me speaking, not the Finance Committee speaking. Julie Chalfant, South yeah. Mill River Road. Um, once the funding is placed into this housing reserve, can, it, can we then later vote to change it to anything else, or is it forever and always in the housing reserve? I think it can move. Council it believes can, it can move. It can move with a vote of town meeting. A vote. That would, okay. Thank you. <laughs> we discussed this during our finance committee, uh, committee meeting. So I guess, why are we putting $209,000 specifically into community housing and not just leave it in the general fund? And when it comes time to do the housing, simply vote it into the housing. And that way, it's just one less vote that you have to go through. And I understand, I'm not against, I'm not against uh, uh, community housing and affordable housing. I understand that completely. But why go through two, two processes here to end up with the same thing? Mr. White. Can I answer that, Tim, if I answer that? Oh, hi. 
If you could just. Hi, Lily Dwight, South Mill River. I am also the chair of the Senior Housing Committee. And the, I'm also on the Community Preservation Committee. The idea of this is that we are gonna be going for grants. And if we have $500,000, that's what we were looking for, to show that this town is committed, and we're also looking for town land that we already own, then our hope is that even in this time of incredibly expensive and challenging building, we will be able to get a grant by showing this commitment, especially since if things don't work out, which we hope they do, um, that it can always be moved back to the general reserve. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. St. Peter. I, I was on the uh, Community Preservation Committee for several years, and I guess I'm not sure whether the question was answered right or I misinterpreted the Unless things have changed, it has always been my understanding that once it goes into one of those three required funds, the uh, open space, the historical, or the uh, community housing, that that's where it had that's where it stayed until it was uh, expended on those particular um, units. I do not believe that it can be transferred back out of housing once it's been in or back out of open space that it can only be uh, transferred to those particular uh, 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 those particular uh, departments. Would you clarify that? Uh, I, I don't think we can, Mr. St. Peter. I think council has, has felt that she's expressed an opinion, but we don't have the statute in front of us, so it may be something that we need to follow up on. I, I certainly can't. I, I, I just don't want people having the wrong answer and at least have the answer retracted until for further I think information. That's fair. Yep. Council, would you rather just you wanna wait a second? I mean I got it. It's my understanding with a vote of town meeting, so long as you keep your mon your ten percent contribution every year in, you can make the transfer with a vote of town meeting. I'm happy to take the time to double check, but that's my understanding, Mr. St. Pierre. I would request a double check on that. So let's Thank go you. with the let's go with the assumption that it cannot be moved, and if well, during the debate, and if we're able to put our fingers on it, we can discuss it further. And that way, there's no. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm. Uh, go ahead. Erica Higgins Ross, 22 Greeno Crossing Road. Very brief comment that my understanding of this allocation is that. We as a town have shown our commitment to um, preserving the beauty of the town and the open space, and those are all really important. Since I've been here, that's definitely been a priority, and I think this shows our priority is also affordable housing, making our town accessible to more people, and supporting that, and get grant money to make that happen. Any other questions? Yes. So my, hello. Hello, okay. Um, my understanding is that the way that we can um, clearly define what we mean is that we need a motion to change this and then if that motion gets voted down, it will be very clear that we wanted, um, our intent is very clear. So I'm going to make a motion that we change the transfer housing reserve, the change to the transfer, I'm gonna start over. We are going, I, I am making a motion that we change the transfer to the housing reserve to 10% at $33,525. Second. Uh, Sorry, that has to be a minimum of $38,000 because our budget is $380,000. So friendly amendment, second to that. I second. Um, so, so, when this is, uh, so this debate is solely on that matter. There's been a request to reduce down item C from the $209,000 to $38,000. Is that correct? Try to skip yes. here, make them come to you. Any questions on that? 
Mr. Helchi? Yes, so a little explanation about why the uh, mm -hmm. committee um, suggested that we do this. Uh, we wanted to give the townspeople the uh, ability to vote their commitment to raising money for this specific purpose. And yes, we could indeed, at some future date, take money from a general fund and do something like this. But unless we do this, we can't go to grant authorities and say, we have a 500,000 plus fund and we'd like you to contribute two or three million dollars to a community housing program uh, that we could then put in place. So this allows the community to decide. We don't think that 55,000 is the right thing to do, 55%, or we do think it's the right thing to do. So what I would urge, urge people to vote no on this proposed amendment. In the back. Laurie Vusader, 193 North Main Street. I would just like to honor the recommendations of the Community Preser Preservation Committee who knows all the ins and outs of this and not make a change because it's not saving us money, it's just allocating money we already have aside. So I'd like to go with the recommendation of the committee who's worked so hard on this. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Um, if we can't turn the mic. Hello. 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 It's not working. Ah, uh, now it's working. Um, so if we, I, I am not against community housing. Um, I, I would just want to make the vote very clear by making this motion. I also want to say that there are other things that could be done with the money. For example, the building that the senior center is currently located in could be designated as a historic building and repaired using community CPA funds. Um, if we place all of these funds strictly in community housing, it restricts our ability to spend those funds on other needs should we decide those needs are more important or come first, um, you know, in time, not in importance. Um, and so I believe that putting 55% into the community housing restricts our ability um, to be flexible. Yes, right here. Hi, Jennifer Remillard, um, resident of Conway Street. Um, I feel that the CPA um, committee exists for a reason. They obviously have done all of the research to determine the best way to utilize our funds. If in the future, once the studies regarding the buildings that which have already been completed are done, if it's determined that we can utilize funds, we can vote for that in the future with future money appropriated at that time. But as Mr. White has also brought forward, we cannot go to the community or to the state and look for grants to support community housing if our own community won't support it. Why do we expect the state or other entities to? Thank you. Anyone, any other comments? Dan? I'm gonna, yes. To the table? Well, okay, uh, Dave Wolfram. The uh, Deerfield has for years and years been trying to get senior housing going. To me, this is a first giant step to make sure we're doing it correctly and we shouldn't backtrack at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rathman, just anyone who hasn't spoken yet, I'm trying to get to, and then we'll go back. I really hate to see the senior affordable housing advocates uh, pitted against the senior center advocates because both of them are priorities for sure. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that almost a million dollars in CPA funds has been devoted to two soccer fields while we're arguing over the difference between 38,000 and 209,000, which I think is a shame. Mr. St. Peter. 
Uh, I apologize for opening up such a can of worms, mm -hmm. but uh, I really, I just wanted to clarify the information that was being put out. Uh, I fully support the 209000 and I think it was Ms. Rimmelaer said that we've spent over a million dollars, uh, appropriated over a million dollars for uh, recreation. We've appropriated th hundreds of thousands of dollars previously for rec recreation. We've appropriated well over 100000 for historical preservation in other aspects. Uh, you know, we have not appropriated anything for community housing, so I would recommend sticking with the uh, community preservation community um, recommendations of the 209000 Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's let's just. Uh, I'm going to let Mr. White speak, and then we'll see where we're at if that's okay. Uh, Lily Dwight, super fast. I just want to point out that there is still over a million dollars in the undesignated reserve balance, because I agree with Julie that we need to be flexible. But I think a million dollars is pretty good flexibility, even with this allocation. Thank you, Mr. Hilchey. You call the question. Is there a second on that? Second. When an individual calls the question, there's no further debate. There's now a vote on whether to call the vote. So this first vote is just on the call of the question. So we need two-thirds majority to do that. All those in favor of calling the question and stopping debate? Opposed? We're now moving to the motion to amend, which was the uh, uh, Julie's motion to change the amount from the 209000 to 38000 all those in favor of that, a motion to amend. Opposed. That amendment does not carry. So we're back to the underlying motion. Is there any other further discussion on the CPC motion in general? All those in favor? Opposed. The motion carries. Article 10, Mr. McDaniel. So I move the town uh, vote to change the use of the property shown as map 151, lot 1, including approximately 8.5 acres, plus or minus, and conveyed to the town of Deerfield by Joyce A. Prevere by deed dated June 29, 2020, and recorded into the Franklin County Registry of Deeds in Book 7566, page 283 from general recreational purposes as set forth in Article 16 of the 2020 Annual Town Meeting to park and outdoor recreational purposes pursuant to General Law Chapter uh, 45, Section 3. Confirm the appropriation previously approved in Article 13, Paragraph C of the 2020 Annual Town Meeting as follows, $198. $1,870 from the Community Preservation Fund Open Spaces Reserve, $900,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Undesignated Fund Balance, and 151, excuse me, and 51130 from the Community Preservation Fund 2021 Estimated Reserves. Confirm the appropriation previously approved in Article 4 of the 2020 Special Town Meeting as follows, $153,516 from the budgeted reserve fund and $846,484 from the undesignated fund balance for a total of $2,150,000. $150, and authorize the select board to submit on behalf of the town any and all applications deemed necessary for grants and or reimbursements from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, PL 88-578 grant program. Second. Mr. McDaniel, briefly. So pursuant to the request of the Commonwealth of, uh, for the pur purchase, uh, for the proposed proposes of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, all appropriations must appear in one article. This article does not, uh, does that and does not change any of the amounts of the original appropriations from the 2020 town meetings. Further, the Commonwealth requires a specific reference to General Law Chapter 45, Section 3, and clarification that that land is limited in use to park and outdoor recreational purposes. So again, this, this article is before you, this piece of property is before you for the kind of the third time, but it's really just um, setting, setting the language correctly so that we can 
uh, get uh, approval on a grant of um, over nine hundred thousand dollars for the project. Are there any questions? Yes. I'm um, confused why we're voting on this. My name is Greg Franceschi, 80 North Main Street. I'm confused why we're voting on this before we have a decision about whether we're going to change the bylaws of the town to make that piece of land accessible. Currently, um, as probably most of you know, um, there are 65 feet of frontage going to that property, and according to the town's current bylaws, that's not enough land to create a road going into the property. So I'm not sure why we're changing the designation before we know whether we have access to the land. Well, it, it's before the other article on the warrant, for one, and, um, and, and because we need to, to, to recertify the use and intent of the property for, um, for application to this grant, for having it being awarded. Mr. Decker. Warning clarification. Uh, the printing copy here says revenues, uh, and I think uh, when Trevor s spoke, I think he said reserves. Revenue is correct, but I, I, I did note the same. Yeah. All right, I just want to make sure we clarified it so correct. we didn't get tripped up going down the road. No, nope. thank you. And one other point. I think the town has an option of running a road in and putting a pork chop uh, uh, frontage thing in to get the frontage, but it's costly. Ms. Rathbone? I have a written um, motion to vote on Article 10 after discussion and vote on Article 17 is complete. I think that would make far more sense. I'm not looking so much uh, at a, a rethink, even though most people know my stance. I think it's excellent to have this outlined all in one place so that we can see exactly what we're spending money on, rather than on sidewalks or on seniors or on affordable housing. I think that it's mainly contributing to that. I question the idea of doing it ahead of time because it's to get a grant and we were led down the garden path already on the idea of a grant which we did not get and which uh, any grant application should reflect the voices of all the people in town, not just the applicants from my canvassing people are taking a second look at all of this. And unless someone else uh, proposes a motion, I have a written one right now, Mr. Graves, if that's what's required. And just so I understand, your motion is to uh, change the order? To vote on Article 10 after the discussion and vote on Article 17 is complete. I, I believe Ms. Rathbone and Council is confirming uh, that motion could have been made prior to the article, but now that the motion has been made on that, uh, we cannot change the order in that method. Then I'm in the very unfortunate position of urging everyone to vote no on this, knowing that uh, it's a complete hypothetical as to whether um, this uh, grant will be obtained. The bottom line is it, it's okay. It's not the real discussion is going to come on Article 17. Bottom line is it's okay. I just I have not had a chance to see that grant application and I'd like to know what claims and representations it makes to the state. For example, representing that everybody in the town is for this project. So at any rate, I um, I'll, I'll come out in the end as ultimately <laughs> wanting it, but not going to be offended if it doesn't get voted. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Well, uh, just 
all this article is doing is reaffirming what, what we've already done and, and saying that it, it is for a park and, um, and for outdoor recreation. All the other votes have already taken. This body has already approved all of this. It's just reaffirming that. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Helchi? So just to confirm, th this if we voted this down, we wouldn't be in compliance and we wouldn't be available to uh, receive the national grant. That's correct. But if we vote it, we would be able to receive the $932,000 grant, which would then subsequently reduce and probably return money to the CPC fund. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. It has already gone through the state process and is at the federal level now. Yes. I'm Rick Andrioli from Sherman Drive. I just wonder, Mr. Moderator, can we just table the motion until we get to the other one? I, with the appropriate request to do that in voting? I request we table the motion. Second on that? It's not debatable. Not debatable. So all those in favor of tabling this motion until after 17? It's a two-thirds vote, so I do need to... Now, if you can keep your hands up, I apologize. I'm going to have to do it quick. Uh, based on the um, check-in, we had 189 voters, so two-thirds was not met. So that motion is not tabled. Uh, is there further debate on the underlying motion? All those in favor? Yes. Uh, just keep your hands up, but if anyone's not using their pink card, really keep your hand up because I, I, it's very difficult up here. So if the pink cards, that's great. Thanks. Uh, that motion carries. Did you ask for those opposed? Those opposed? Motion carries by a two-thirds majority. Article 11, Mr. Wolfram. I move the town vote to allow the select board to submit a home rule petition as set forth in the warrant. Second. 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 Brief talking point, Chief. Hi. Almost good afternoon. Uh, once in a while, we do have police officers that have been on the job for 30 or 40 years. They do reach that minimum mandatory retirement age of 65 years old, as uh, provided in the statutes of Massachusetts general law. The only way to allow them to work beyond 65 years old is to actually pass it through town meeting here, at which point we have to have a legislative uh, representative file a bill, and it has to go through the state. And that's all we are doing today. So I know we did one last year at town meeting. And I'm yet again asking you to consider keeping a police officer on that's uh, been working for 
multiple municipalities for over 40 years. Thank any you. Any, thank you. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Article 12, Ms. Shores Ness. I move the town vote to amend the Town of Deerfield General Bylaws, Chapter 35, Article 2, Section 35 to 25, by, amending, by adding Juneteenth Independence Day to the list of paid holidays and to add the same holiday for all benefited employees, including those belonging to the collective bargaining units and those contracted under other agreements. Seconded. Thank you. Ms. Shores Ness? The state has previously recognized this, but it's necessary for us um, to re do this as a town meeting vote. Finance Committee? So the Finance Committee did deliberate on this. Um, I want to point out that this is not a revenue neutral proposal. If we declare another paid holiday, that puts the town at 13 paid holidays. Um, our town employees are fantastic and work very hard. They aren't sitting around twiddling their thumbs. So one more paid holiday means either, either the pay of overtime um, or a loss of a day of product, um, productivity. So for, from that perspective, the finance did not recommend it. I've also been asked by some of the members on the finance committee to point out that this was not a unanimous vote. Um, and that the vote was from the perspective of the revenue impact that this vote would cause. Thank you. Yes. Um, Ali Vandervelden, 99 Hillside Road Finance Committee member, and I just want to point out on these several um, articles that I was the seventh member, and if anybody reads the minutes, there were only six votes, um, and I do support these changes. So. If you look closely at the minutes, it would not have changed some of the outcomes, but it would have changed others. But I just want to share that with the town um, in case that finance committee support is a um, determining factor. It's a, some of them were very close. On this one, it wouldn't have changed. On this one, it might not have. But there's I won't speak for the other upcoming ones. There's only one. Okay. Any other questions or comments in the back on the left? Uh, I'm sorry, right back there. I apologize. Yeah. Erica Higgins Ross, Personnel Board. I just have a short statement because um, the Personnel Board voted unanimously, or actually, we originally voted unanimously and we had one abstention on our final vote um, to support this. And the Personnel Board, if anyone doesn't know, is a town board and we work um, on behalf of employees and the town to make sure that it's a fair and equitable place to work. Um, as most of you know, Juneteenth is a holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the United States, observed annually on June 19th. In July 2020, the state of Massachusetts adopted Juneteenth as an official holiday. Governor Baker said making June 19th an annual state holiday would help recognize the continued need to ensure racial freedom and equity. Now that it's an official state holiday, the offices in all towns in Massachusetts will be required to be closed on that day. So if we do not vote to pay our employees for this official statewide holiday, we're asking them to either work for free, take an unpaid day, or substitute and sacrifice another paid holiday. In effect, if we do not pay our employees for this official state holiday, instead of observing and celebrating this important holiday, we're making it into a punitive experience for employees. The Personnel Board strongly advocates voting yes to accept Juneteenth as a paid holiday for all town employees. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question in the back or a comment. Hi, Ann Mary Cloutier, 51 uh, Eastern Ave. I was wondering what the price tag is, how much exactly it would cost us um, to make it a holiday. If the Finance Committee could speak to that. Were you able to compute that I out? Don't have I don't have a dollar value. Um, Brenda, do you have something? I, I do not. Any other comments? Mr. Decker? There's a microphone coming. Is this not an unfunded mandate from the Commonwealth? And didn't we vote under two and a half that they couldn't do that without paying us for them? So the selectmen should follow up with the uh, 
appropriate people at the state level to get reimbursement for <coughs> what we're paying because it's an unfunded mandate. And refer it to the state auditor. There was a question. Uh, yeah, I. Um, I'd like to support what the personnel board put forth and ask community members to um, examine, as we all are as a nation and a community, um, where we stand on racism right now and the basis of this vote. So please vote your conscience and take that into deep consideration. Questions? Yes. Hi, John Foresky. For clarity, Mr. Decker, the state didn't mandate it being a paid holiday. They just mandated it be a holiday, and it's up to the individual towns to decide whether it's paid or not. We've got to do. We've got to turn around and pay our people because they want us to make sure everything is closed. So I think that they should put up the money. Any other questions? We've got one here, Dan. Mr. McDaniel? I, I would just uh, like to voice my support for this holiday. Our, our employees work extremely hard for our residents, and I, I hope that if it passes that, that our employees and, and all of us take a day of action to figure out, um, you know, how we can recognize where we've been in the past and how we can move forward uh, in healing in this country. Uh, we've had a turbulent, turbulent couple years and um, it, it's time to take some time and reflect and, and see where we can offer our help and action. Thank you. You sure, sir? I apologize for the delay there. Any other questions, comments? Uh, I'm seeing a point. Yes. Hi, Lori Conlin. I live on Hillcrest Avenue and I think it's important to think about the fact that we're voting on a funding issue to, um, that's related to a celebration of the end of slavery. So I think that it should um, very clearly be a paid date. And also think about the fact that it's not so much what people say, it's what we do, and that this is more of an action than just a statement against racism. It's a um, concerted action of uh, our community against racism. Thank you. Front table. This is me speaking, not the Finance Committee speaking. I um, actually think that the end of slavery is something that absolutely should be celebrated by our country. I think it's something the country has done um, that is pretty impressive and good. Any other comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Article 13, Mr. McDaniel. I move the town vote to amend the town of Deerfield, uh, Chapter 35, Article 2, Section 35-25, holidays by renaming Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, as set forth in the warrant. Second. We need a second. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. McDaniel. So, so again, this is... Um, I think a lot of communities around around the country have have looked to um, reflected, I guess, on where we've been over the last uh, couple of years and 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 200 years. And I think it, um, it it would mean a lot if Deerfield kind of moved forward and recognized our indigenous people who who were here long before we all showed up and and maybe celebrate celebrate them instead. So. Finance. There are no financial implications of this. Uh, yes, Mr. Pachori. During school, when I went to Frontier Regional and grammar school, I was never a history buff. Didn't care much about it. But once I went to Army War College, I learned all lot, an awful lot about history and I learned the value of history. Here you turn around saying, Christopher Columbus did not come and discover America. He didn't discover it. 
indigenous people did. I think this is ridiculous. So I'm voting against it, and I'm going to ask anybody else who cares a little bit about history to join me and vote against us because this is ridiculous that we turn around and say, oh, the indigenous people discovered America. What, what Thank you. you. Uh, personnel. I'm Lisa Middens, North Main Street Personnel Board, and we voted three zero one extension uh, one with one abstention to recommend that the name of Columbus Day holiday be re changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. Following the lead of the school district, eleven states and 130 cities across the United States, and this is a movement that started in 1992, so it's not new, and all have done so with the intention of working towards dismantling systemic racism and as a I have a master's in public history, and history is political, and it's the, the version of the story that you choose as a body to promote. So this isn't changing history. This is just signaling that we as a body are honoring indigenous people. In the front. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Remillard. I live on Conway Street in Deerfield. Um, I strongly support this amendment because the Pakumtuk people were here long before Christopher Columbus came and supposedly discovered this country. My heritage is not only some of the settlers from this area, also ancestors were indigenous people, and also Italian. And a person who was raised as a white woman, I feel as though we should celebrate the people who were here long before colonialists and settlers came to this country. So I strongly support this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in the front. Hi, my name is Ava Gibbs. Um, I'm confused in all due respect to the Finance Committee. If this has no financial implication, why was there a vote on the Finance Committee? I'd love to hear the answer. Thank you. I'm going to let Finance respond. Then. The state, uh, there's actually a state law that requires the Finance Committee to vote on every warrant article that is brought to the town, and that is, I guess, obviously supported by the town bylaws as well. So it's state law and town bylaw that we consider every article that's brought to the town. Mr. Olmstead, do you wish to be heard? Uh, Let's see if this, that does work. Uh, the, the strange thing about this is not the Columbus Day or the Indigenous Peoples Day, it's the fact that we actually have a state law that requires the governor to promote Colum Columbus Day. So what we should be doing is directing our attention to our state legislators and getting them to change that law. That's the real issue. Yes. Mike's on its way, Mr. Andrelli. I feel like I'm swimming upstream, but my name is Rick Andreoli. I live on Sherman Drive. Give you a little information about Columbus Day. The first official uh, Columbus Day was held in Boston and New York in 1792. Uh, it wasn't an official day aside from the historical societies of each of those cities. The next one where we would call it a Columbus Day was in 1892. And that was based upon the fact that a few weeks before October, or October 12th, 11 Italian immigrants were lynched in New Orleans for a crime that no one seems to understand, remember, or care about. Now next we come upon 1920s and Sacco Vanzetti. Mr. Sacco and Mr. Vanzetti, again two Italian immigrants, were tried, convicted, and executed for a crime which they didn't commit. And basically, even though many people were uh, in favor of letting them go, they were still executed. And there were uproarings across the United States and other parts of the world, similar to when George Flood was killed. So based upon all of that, the president in 1932 proclaimed a national holiday on October 12th to be called Columbus Day. Now, Columbus Day is not a major holiday. I'm, you know, it's not Easter, et cetera. And it's basically like President's Day. Instead of being a specific date, it happens to be a day in October, just like President's Day is a day in February. I realize that 
you may think I'm a racist because I'm arguing for Columbus Day, but I'm not. I'm just arguing for the fact that we have a holiday. And I think that, if you think about it, February is Black History Month. May is Asian and Pacific Islander Month. June is Gay Pride Month. Why are we restricting to indigenous people to just one day? Why don't we make Thanksgiving the, the month of November, because it has Thanksgiving, as Indigenous Peoples Month? And I do recommend to people that they realize that Columbus never set foot on North America. He went to the Dominican Republic and never came in here. So I, I, I realize he's an easy target. You know, you can't blame the, the pilgrims for being bad to the indigenous people. So let's pick on Columbus. So my suggestion would be to change this to we make a vote that we have uh, uh, the month of November be Indigenous Peoples Month. Thank you. Comment? Thank you. John Altman, North Hillside Road. Like the last item that we were discussing, Juneteenth Day, this article is about us as a community recognizing our history. It's not to denigrate Columbus. It's not to say who did or didn't discover America. It's about us acknowledging the fact of a, a nation or a race of people who suffered enormously and are still suffering in order that all of us can enjoy the benefits of this great country that we live in. And starting small with our own community, this is us acknowledging that fact and moving forward to heal everyone. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Thank you. Again, Jennifer Remillard. Um, November is Native American History Month. Also, if people are concerned with the mistreatment of people, Irish descent, Italian descent, et cetera, we could petition the state government, the national government, to recognize those particular mis wrongs in our community, in our country. Um, also, the state. Uh, legislation has been moving forward to make this indigenous day throughout the state. It was proposed in 2020 and has been gaining momentum from there, just to educate people who don't know. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Article 13. Article 14, Ms. Shores Ness. I move the town vote to amend the Town of Deerfield General Bylaws, Chapter 10, Article 4, Section, I mean, Article 6, sorry, Section 10 to 17 capital improvement recommendations by replacing the first sentence in the paragraph with the following language as presented in this guide. Second. Ms. Shores Ness. Um, this is an attempt to adjust the budget process to make the committee work more um, and the vast amount of work that we try to do um, more relevant and timely. I have been on the original committee as a planning board member and then now many years as a select board representative and we are constantly trying to um, tweak this and make it more flexible and in the last couple of years the 60-day requirement has just been too early. We haven't had budget information and so it's very hard to put the capital improvement um, recommendations with priorities to the town meeting. So we had originally voted as a committee to do 14 days and then we went to the select board and as and um, uh, and the finance committee to recommend the f uh, 14 days and then we decided you know actually it might be a little tight 
uh, for review. So we're compromised on 21 days, and we're hoping that this will work. Again, this is to make it the work of the um, Capital Improvement Committee timely and relevant to our budget. Does Capital Improvement wish to speak first? Uh, yes, as a, as a capital improvement committee. I don't think the mic is. Uh, just bring the mic closer, Jeff. As a capital improvement committee, we voted to uh, make the change to 21 days. We had originally voted 14. Uh, when we met with finance committee in uh, the uh, yeah select board, we realized that through the budgeting process, we actually needed a little more time. They needed a little more time. So we compromised and came up with the 21 days. As Carolyn said, the 60 days, it was just too tight. It didn't work. We weren't able to uh, develop the type of plans that this town deserves because we didn't have the financial information that we as a committee needed. So uh, the 21 days, we are recommending as a finance committee, uh, capital improvement committee. Thank you. And finance committee? The finance committee did not recommend the 14 days, but we did vote this morning and we do recommend the 21 day. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Article 15, uh, Mr. Wolfram. I move the town amend the town of Deerfield bylaws by deleting the word selectman each time it appears in said bylaw and inserting the term select board in place thereof and further deleting the word select board of selectmen each time it appears and inserting in place thereof the term select board and further that the town clerk be authorized to make clerical ed editorial and other adjustments to the efficient and purposes thereof boy seconded effectually tell a lawyer put this one together <laughs> <laughs> mr. Wolfram briefly summarize um, it, this is just making our bylaws uh, our general bylaws uh, gender neutral um, you know those of you who have been around here a long time know that the this board has been compromised, uh, composed of at least one female for... <laughs> <laughs> We've been compromised, but... <laughs> By one female, yes, no. Uh, but we've had one, you know, Betty Kirkwood served for years and years, and now Carolyn has been here for years and years, and it's, it's rec right that we recognize it as a gender-neutral board. Finance? Strangely enough, this does have financial considerations because as we're, it clarifies the language throughout so that we're consistent, so that when we're applying for loans or bonds, there is no question about whether there are two boards, the select board and the board of selectmen, there is only one. So the finance committee does support this. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Article 16, Ms. Shores Ness. I move the town pass over this article. Second. That article is passed over. Article 17, Mr. McDaniel. I move the town vote to amend the town of Deerfield zoning bylaws, chapter 179, article 2, entitled Use and Dimensional Regulations, section uh, 2300, entitled Dimensional Requirements, adding a new subscript 9 after principal use in the heading of the principal use column and adding the following new definition of subscript 9 at the end of the, quote, notes section thereof as follows. Seconded. And, and you had uh, said superscript 9, correct? Yes, superscript 9. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finance? Or, I'm sorry, Mr. McTaylor, you, you wish to speak to this first? Uh, ju just that, um, I'll just read the subscript. These provisions shall not apply to town-owned lots used for municipal facilities, which shall be required to have no less than 50 feet of frontage, except that the front, rear, and side yard setback requirements noted herein shall apply. Uh, notwithstanding the foregoing, the planning board, upon application of the applicant, may waive and reduce the setback requirements if, in the opinion of the planning board, is in the public interest to do so. 
Thank you. Finance. The Finance Committee discussion revolved around this being municipal projects only, and um, I believe they still require site review, but there, there was not a huge amount of discussion, and we support it. Great. Thank you. Uh, planning Board? Yes. The um, town owns many nonconforming lots that currently are in use, and these changes give the town more flexibility in developing these properties for public use. Uh, the Planning Board also recognized that many layers of review remain for municipal projects, such as Select Board, Planning Board, Town Meeting, just even uh, voting to approve budgets for municipal projects. So the Planning Board is supportive of this. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Ms. Rathbone? <laughs> I just wanted to get in a little shade. I just want to borrow some of this shade. Um, I'm voting against Article 17, and based on my door-to-door uh, -door walks in the last week, I see that a lot of you met, might support it, too. Article 17 says that if the planning board decides it's in the public interest, the town government could construct buildings on its property without any setbacks at all. And regardless of whatever frontage is required in a particular district, the town would only need 50 feet of frontage. This is a huge, huge change. Um, I have the list of uh, 49 of the town-owned properties, certainly where we are, it has a strong impact on at least 10 families. So you just multiply 49 times 10, and you've got almost 500 people in this town significantly impacted by a proposed change that has had no study, no public comment, and to do it here in town meeting seems uh, just really unfortunate to me. This is something that, if it's going to be considered, deserves a full hearing process. It's so radical and unusual that very few towns exempt their own governments from having to abide by dimensional zoning bylaws and especially dimensional setback provisions. Deerfield, in 350 years, has always lived by the same rules as its residents and I don't know why now the select board seeks to be exempt. I have my suspicions. So this proposed bylaw would apply to any property the town now owns or obtains in the future, and the town could build a raw sewage pumping station right next to a residential neighbor's property, build a DPW terminal on a property with only 50 feet of frontage, even if the property is located between two residential properties purchase and take non-building lot properties for a small amount of money and intensively develop that property to the detriment of the neighbors with the neighbors unable to be financially compensated. It's not fair and we should not vote to allow this. Um, the layers of review that um, the select board referenced, I have to say personally they have not worked. I have been running like a crazy person since my dad died to understand, to analyze, and to figure out some project that came into existence with a $2 million budget next to my house while we continue to agonize over all of these other big public policy matters. Um, so there should be pub multiple public hearings with outreach to the citizens. Um, like I said, that layer didn't really work very well for the North Main Street. Um, with some study and input, perhaps some new and more reasonable bylaw could be crafted for municipal facilities. So I would urge us to wait until that point in the future rather than going whole hog right now. Um, so I do believe this is connected to the property at North Main. And when uh, the, the uh, select board urged the voters last year to purchase the Preveri property, um, it was not a building lot. This fixes that. 
I um, worked with John McLaughlin, a land use attorney, and he was the person who let the select board know that what they were proposing uh, was not possible under the current bylaws. So you can thank me for this article. <laughs> um, they, it cannot be done. And think of the irony of it. 200 feet for an industrial property is required so you have plenty of room for lots of traffic. That makes sense. Our residences only require 100, but industrial 200. This would shrink the requirement down to 50. So you have the prospect of uh, 70 parking spaces and 10 buses with hundreds of people going in and out of the North Main project with 50 feet of frontage. It's currently 67. Um, the main argument in favor of Article 17 is that because it's the government doing the proposed development, it should be allowed. Yet intensive <coughs> development undertaken without the protection of dimensional bylaws on town property all over town will have a serious detrimental impact on all of the neighbors, even if it is the government undertaking it. So I spoke with many of you over the last few days who spoke to me about thinking that this was a, a really weak idea, and I encourage you to speak out now. Thank you. Yes. Um, Jennifer Remillard, Conway Street. There were multiple hearings. There was planning board speaking. There was a town meeting information session. So the fact that Ms. Rathburn is saying that there wasn't an opportunity for people to speak and to get information is incorrect. Um, I strongly support this. There are 62 properties that the town owns currently. And by enabling um, or by shrinking the frontage to 50 feet versus that uh, current 100, it will enable the community to have access to property, which could also um, increase housing abilities, as well as other small parks or parklets within our community. There's, I have to drive to go to a park. Um, I would like to reduce my carbon footprint and just walk over to a park um, within our community. And I don't think that this is specifically for the park that is currently going through a process, because as um, Ms. Wolfcool mentioned there is actual processes that need to be followed by the town in order to get anything uh, accomplished. So there will still be an opportunity for residents to oppose any future projects that are brought forward. Um, it's not just an overall done deal within the town meeting. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Brown. Eric Brown, 72 North Main. So I want to make sure everyone's clear. I'm not against soccer fields, facilities for the school. As Mr. Modesto might tell you, that's why my family's here. So increasing that, I'm all for. What concerns me about this article is the access to the 62 properties we just talked about. There's a reason they haven't been accessed yet, is because there's traffic flow issues. There's, you know, like, like um, I believe it's Judith said, I apologize if I don't cut your name. There, there's a reason that the road frontage is there, and that's for volume of traffic. Just like we said, we don't have access. Well, we need access be for people for volume. I live on the corner of Brayburn and North Main. There's a property the town owns down Brayburn. If you were to put something in there, and this bylaw would let it happen, my kids would be at risk due to the volume of traffic that would be going in and out of Brayburn. You can barely fit two cars down there now. When we back up to pull out and someone wants to get by, we have to pull onto someone else's driveway or someone else's lawn. It's not feasible. That's why this bylaw exists. If you want to set it up in a case-by-case -case basis, that might make sense where it might fit. But if to just blanket approve everything right here, we're, we're going down a slippery slope. Okay, civil engineer by trade, there's a reason these rules exist, and it's for capacity and public safety. Thank you. And right next to you, did you still have a comment? Lisa Middens, North Main Street. Um, I just wanted to confirm that if we change this bylaw, that doesn't mean that we're pre-approving any future projects that might occur. That's, that's correct. Is correct. that correct? Correct. So we will have a discussion and a town meeting vote on each project individually. And um, I know that this property was discussed at length the last town meeting last year. And one of the 
a lot of parents spoke about the need for athletic fields that are more accessible, and I want to just say that I'm in favor of doing this, even though I live on North Main Street right in front of that beautiful field that no one can get into, and they could potentially maybe make demand that I have a road right through my yard. I, you know, and, and that might be for senior housing, and I feel like for, for community good, sometimes you have to sacrifice some people, that there's always gonna be not in my backyard mentality, and you have to weigh and decide as a community where the benefits go. And, when I, and as far as athletic fields that potentially could be walked to from the high school, that is a huge, um, economic justice issue for kids that come from from homes where there's a single parent who's working all day that can't pick them up from fields here and there in Sunderland or whatever they could actually walk to those fields and just as we've seen the amount of stress on teens the past year and the outlet that they've received by being able to participate in athletics is huge I know you know especially girls at home so anxious they, they don't want to go to school, but yet they can still participate in sports. So anything that can open access to sports, I'm definitely in favor of. When I was in school, there was paid athletic buses, so nobody needed parents to pick them up. The school system took care of that, and that doesn't happen anymore. And you have, so it's kids that are really advantaged can take care of, can participate in athletics, and kids that aren't often can't. Thank you. Ms. Dwight? Hi, Lily Dwight, South Mill River. I'm going to jump, jump to the other end of the age spectrum. And uh, as chair of the Senior Housing Committee, um, to sort of take a brief moment, one of the things that we were really looking at is not building a ghetto for we older types, but we had talked about lots of small cluster housing, and we've been identifying parcels all through town. And because the idea would be that you could live in a small space, you could walk to the market, gas station, library, et cetera. And so we think that this will help in developing small clusters of housing for older adults in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel? A question uh, I just wanted to um, reply back to Eric Brown's concern. Um, he's right, we're, we're not looking to run um, access through Braeburn Ave because, you, for one, it, you know, listen, yes. listening to the, the fire department, you need to get, have access, you know, wide enough for, for the fire trucks and all of that kind of thing. So this, this, this would be looking in the future if a parcel of land came up on North Main that we could purchase as a town. Of course, there's a lot of hypotheticals here, but we could maybe gain access a different way to not run down that narrow street because we do recognize that would be uh, too narrow for a fire truck to go through. Um, you know, for the for the park project and, and many other projects, you know, we think it's reasonable, and there, there'll be a lot of checks and balances with the planning board. And yet, in the back, uh, Peter LaBarbera, Ridge Road. I've been a zoning practitioner for the better part of forty years. I can explain <coughs> the purpose. Of frontage minimum frontage requirements the purpose of minimum frontage requirement is to make sure that uses of land do not minimize the nuisance effect on adjacent properties there as as you have recently witnessed site plan approval is not a legally binding process Ultimately, it can be overturned and it is not enforceable. So therefore, the supposition that you will properly deliberate on a land use through the, purpose of, through the process of site plan <coughs> review is an illusion. The proper method of addressing when properties are situated in such a way that there is inadequate dimensional compliance the proper and integral method of addressing that is to go to the Zoning Board of Appeal and secure a variance in a case-by-case -case basis. And in such a deliberation, the merits and demerits of a proposal will be explored and debated and understood. And in the most compelling circumstances, the public is going to recognize that there is going to have to be an adverse effect on adjacent properties for the greater public good. 
and that this is not the way to proceed. To create a blanket exception for all municipal uses is completely antithetical to the underlying principle of zoning regulation, particularly zoning regulation in Massachusetts. The proper way to do it, as I repeat, is you go to the Zoning Board of Appeal and you secure a variance and the criteria are there in the statute for a variance to be granted when warranted on a case-by-case -case basis. With respect to the proposed recreational area, I suspect that that would be the outcome. But that It's including the zoning board. No, just the planning board. Planning board. Just the planning board. Planning board. I mean, would, uh, yeah, it would go through the planning board, and if it's case by case, it would still go through the whole process that you would need to go through the planning board, the zoning board, if it's a case by case basis. Is that correct? No, no, no. Just the planning board. No, just the planning board. Town council? Oh, only the planning board um, does site plan review. But it, if you're to do this, I guess I, I guess I'm not understanding this totally. Then, to do this, you need more than a site plan review, right? The m Mr. Yes, uh, yes. The the proposal is to change the zoning for dimensional requirements for all municipal facilities, and um, but un the underlying zoning requires site plan review. Um, likely in most of those instances, I certainly haven't reviewed every single instance, but likely in most of those instances site plan review would be required. And so would zoning? No. no. Oh, okay. This would largely resolve the zoning question on frontage, at least, or it would resolve. Setback and frontage. For setback and frontage. Uh, in the front. Yeah. Oh, you're checking. Linda Snappy, 17 Braverman Road. When I brought uh, my property with my spouse five years ago, the day before we were gonna close, there was a front page story in the Republican saying the town of South Deerfield was going to buy a property on Main Street to create access to that land that the senior housing and other uh, projects in the city have, con have considered, but that property was never bought. So now there is an access to that land. Why did the town buy the land when it could? for adequate access. Town meeting voted it down. It was voted down at town meeting at, at that time. I we can't really comment beyond that, but. Okay. Um, that's the Thank only you. comment. I mean, I'm, not, I'm in favor of senior housing. I may need it soon. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, but I am, <clears throat> I'm against this proposal. Was there another somewhere over there? Hi, my name is Bela Breslow. I live on Grave Street. I recently started teaching real estate for a company where we're teaching people who want to get their real estate license, and it's all about exactly what was spoken about, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the processes that are in existence, including variances, special uh, exceptions, and so forth. And I think the town should have to abide by those, as well as individuals. Thank you. There was a, yes. The previous lady uh, that asked about the property that the, the town was going to buy was a property that our two sons bought from my mother's estate. I, I believe the rec committee was going to build ball fields on that property, and uh, they decided not to. Because of 
all the excess water that came, comes off the mountain, it's a muck hole out there till probably this time of the year in normal years. So the town decided not to buy that property. Our sons ended up uh, after they were second choice and our two sons bought it and are farming the property right now. But that was the access through the uh, Galinsky Farms property on North Main Street. Any other comments on the motion? Ms. Rathbone. Would, do, you, do we all want to be limited to one? Yes. Else yes. Mic, so. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, this is Gail, and my property is being surrounded by what's being discussed right now. I'm just wondering what this would mean to the driver. Are they planning, like, the width or how much traffic or um, – and why wasn't this law thought about before the property was purchased? Does anyone wish to speak to that or? You know, it, in municipal projects, you, you learn as you go. Sometimes, you know, I, I like to be honest with everybody, you know, as, as, as we're trying to get this ballpark to go in or to maybe have access to Brayburn for senior housing or, or, another, or another item or, or the Leary lot that we're working on downtown to get parking for economic development, you know, you run into issues where you, where you need to have some access. And, and I think when it, when it comes to when it comes to public use for, for our children, for our families to gather in this location or, you know, to, to be able to get better parking and stuff for downtown or access for senior housing, I think, I think we do have uh, a select board, a planning board that's elected and, and site plan review and, and other ways to kind of discuss these issues and, and to decide whether they're in the best interest of, of the community. Um, you know, there's a lot of communities that give this opportunity um, and, and leeway to their to their municipal projects. Um, we're not the only one, so um, I, I think it, it it makes sense to do it in this location and, and for these for these projects. And the driveway, like, what would what would that mean for my house? Is what's I really want to know. Well, we wouldn't we wouldn't be taking any land from you or anybody else. So, More you know, traffic is. No, it wouldn't mean more traffic. I mean, you have cars coming in to, to, to an event. I mean, mo you know, people are concerned about how much traffic is going in and out of there. Mo if you go to any park, most of the year they're empty. I mean, uh, nights they're empty. Uh, there's very few um, days where they're, they're being used all the time in massive traffic. I mean, you might have a, a summer evening. I think we have four, five concerts this year. Uh, so you might have some music in the, in the evening. So you may have some ball fields and things like that. But it's not a massive traffic kind of situation. Most parks that you see are, are empty most of the time and quiet for people to walk and all. So, you know, there'll definitely be days where you'll have some traffic. But that, yeah, that, will, all get, that. that will all get laid out with site plan review and discussed for sure. I just never heard of like towns changing a law to like do things. It it you know, happens. It happens in many, many communities. Project happen was a, what I'm trying to say. Yep, many communities. Mr. Moderator. Yes, briefly. So first part is I do want to direct a question to Attorney Mead. Is should this fail? Is it legal to put a subdivision access road into that parcel? Yes. Second part that I do want to mention to everybody, and obviously I am in favor of this, I don't want to take away people's rights. However, when we examine safety and accessibility, the vast amount of residents I talk to want things in close proximity to the center of town. They want to be able to walk to the center, to the senior center, to a hopeful future brand new library, to senior housing, schools and link everything together. We are a farming community. With a farming community, it was absolutely normal over the last 100 years to have 5, 10, 20, 30 acre parcels outlined behind houses. Farmers can gain access to them through simple roadways. The towns acquired a few of those over the years and one of the ways we can use them is by passing 
this zoning amendment. Instead of building a subdivision access road, which is far more intense, this gives us the ability to spend less money on the access point, not as wide of the travel lanes, et cetera, et cetera, and go through site plan review with the planning board and make sure the sidewalks, the travel lanes, the parking lot, and the entire property is safe. I do want to be clear that we, no part of our intent is to take away citizens' rights. That's, that's not what this is about. This is about how do we benefit South Deerfield. And we all know it gets restricted when you come into downtown village. So let's look across from the Tilton Library. We know we can't use Brayburn. We can't even fit an ambulance or a fire truck down there, as Eric said. I mean, that's pretty crystal clear. So when a house comes up for sale on North Main Street, and we try and access seven to six or seven acres across from the Tilton Library for senior housing, if we tell any resident up there that we're going to purchase their house and we're going to take the house down for a road, most are not going to sell it to us. If we talk to a resident and we tell them that we're going to divide off 50, 60, 80 feet and resell the house for a slightly diminished value, I would surmise that they would be more likely to part ways with it, with the town, for betterment of everybody as a whole. Thank you. Any other comment on Article 17? I'm sorry? Mr. Decker is called to question. There's no further debate. So the question now stands on whether to call the vote at this point. It, it, I, recognize Mr. I recognize Mr. Decker. So the, the re uh, resolution at this point would be to vote to continue debate. Then you would be voting against the call of the question. All those in favor of calling the question. All those opposed? It's pretty straightforward. The call of the question uh, has succeeded. So all those in favor of Article 17? Again, this is a um, two-thirds majority, so I'm, I do need to count. All those opposed? Uh, the motion does not carry. Article 18, Ms. Wolfcool. Yes, I move the town vote to amend 
the Town of Deerfield Zoning Bylaws, Chapter 179, Article 6, to add the following de three definitions as set forth in the warrant. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Wolfco, if you could briefly summarize. Yes, for all three of these uh, uh, articles that are moving forward, um, they are to clarify requirements when a chain store or restaurant wants to come into town. And in particular, why these are being proposed is to implement town goals of encouraging business while maintaining our rural character. The bylaws set definitions for a chain store or by a restaurant so that we understand that these would be 10 stores worldwide or more um, that have certain standardized features such as signs and decor. Um, it would be effective in the commercially zoned areas of town C1 and C2, however not the northernmost C2 district. Uh, this is prim primarily effective along the 510 corridor. Uh, it would not apply to consumer services such as banks, law offices, health clinics. Um, and in order for a, a chain store to come into town and build in these areas, and definitely they still could come, the developer needs just to modify three exterior design features in order to conform with the neighborhood character. And these are not um, uh, cookie cutter design features, um, that, that, but they do need to modify their facade, their exterior color scheme and de decor or signage. Um, no stores would be prohibited, only the exterior of these chains would be modified in order to fit with the look that residents say they want in the town. And the planning board is supportive of this, or of all three um, articles. Um, finance first, please. Um, so the Finance Committee reviewed and discussed these all, three articles as a group, Articles 18, 19, and 20. Um, the way the, um, and the consensus of the, the vote on for the Finance Committee was not to support these recommendations. The discussion that occurred, um, one is that the bylaw, this bylaw as written gives the impression that the town is anti-business. Um, although the planning board states that um, businesses who um, meet the formula-based business requirements would be allowed to build if they modified their frontage, um, what the bylaw actually says is that um, formula-based businesses that conform to the elements four, five, or six, which is a standardized facade, standardized decor, and standardized signage are prohibited. So the way it is written, it sounds anti-business, and the Finance Committee is concerned that um, this gives the impression that the town is anti-business and will harm our business, the businesses coming to our town. Um, as I said earlier, there's a lot that the town wants to do right now, sewer, library, senior center, senior housing, complete streets, town common, um, all of which is going to require funds to support at the moment, our tax rate is about the middle compared to similar towns. Our borrowing amount is fairly reasonable, um, but we're starting to use our reserves and the amount of free cash we have available is dropping. So there's definite concern that if we harm our business base, we won't be able to afford the changes that the town is talking about making in the future. Comments? Mr. Olmstead? My, my comments, well, Get this here so you can hear. So my comments apply not only to this article, but to articles 19, 20, 21, and 22 as well. So I'll make them all at once, and then you won't have to listen to me after that. We have a problem in this town, and we just don't seem to see it. Simply put, we are losing businesses faster than we are replacing them. And as businesses leave, they take the jobs and the tax dollars with them. Take a good look at the business district in South Deerfield. Compare what you see today with what you would have seen, what would see if you were able to look back 50, 60, 70 years ago. 70 years ago, there were five markets in the center of town. Five markets in the center of town. Three on Elm Street, one on North Main Street, and one on Sugarloaf Street. Today, there is one market on North Main Street. 
Fifty years ago, there were three gas stations in the center of town, all sold gas, all repaired vehicles. Today, there was one real retailer selling gas, Cumberland Farms, not in the center of town anymore, and one facility repairing vehicles. Seventy years ago, there were two stores that sold shoes, one of which also repaired shoes. Today, there are none. Fifty years ago, there were two car dealerships in town. It was a Chevy dealership on North Main Street, up here, and the Saab Volvo dealership that you probably all remember that just recently moved out and, and went to Northampton. These businesses employed substantial numbers of people, but not so many today. These businesses paid taxes, but not so many today, so much today. Sixty or seventy years ago, there was a train station in town but not today. There was a hotel in town. It's still here. We tend to call it Hot Al Warren. Would you like to rent a room? It's open. It is safe to say that the taxes these businesses paid and the number of people they employed is substantially less today than it was 60 or 70 years ago. Oxford Pickle, I think most of us remember Oxford Pickle, employed large numbers of people including jobs for high school students and college students in, in the summer. They paid substantial taxes to the town. Today, they employ no one, and they pay no taxes. They don't exist. Deerfield Plastics was a large employer in South Deerfield. It moved to Waitley. It no longer pays taxes to Deerfield. Miller's Falls Tool employed a substantial number of skilled workers. It was bought out by Ingersoll Rand and give or take 30 years ago, closed. It no longer employs any workers and pays no, no taxes to Deerfield. They have been replaced by Atlantic Furniture. Atlantic Furniture is essentially a warehouse that employs fewer people and pays fewer taxes than its predecessor. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad we have them. But they don't compare with their predecessor. There was a pocketbook factory before I moved to town on North Main Street. There is now an auto parts store in its place, but no one's making pocketbooks. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Yankee Candle, Berkshire Brewing, and maybe even Red Roof Inn. Yankee Candle no longer manufactures candles in Deerfield. They do it in Whateley. And I'm not really sure what the town would do if they were to move out. But what I can tell you is Newell Industry, who owns Yankee Candle, couldn't care less about the town of Deerfield. The point is that there are far fewer businesses in South Deerfield today than there were 50, 60, 70 years ago. They employ far fewer people and pay far fewer taxes than they used to. So what is it that we are being asked to do? In short, and I am being a little sarcastic, we are asked to hang out the unwelcome sign telling business that we only want a select few and that the planning board will decide who those select few are. We are anything but a business-friendly town, and if you don't believe me, I suggest you go out and talk with the business community. Don't be surprised when they tell you that they don't feel particularly welcome here in Deerfield. Also keep in mind that any business that has the slightest concern about the town of Deerfield will simply never look to come here. You won't know it, I won't know it. They just will go someplace else. Hang that sign out that says you're not welcome and see how many come. It's just not the big box stores or the so-called formula-based businesses. It's the little guy who looks around and asks, do I really want to invest in this town? Can I afford the cost of building a business in Deerfield? Take a look at Article 22, Site Plan Review. I assume you all read it, right? Do you understand it? Do you have the financial resources necessary to comply with site plan review if you wanted to start a business? I'm sorry, please please don't speak like that. If, if you'd like to be recognized, please stand and raise your hand, we'll get you a mic, but not in the middle of someone speaking, it's against our bylaws. Mr. Olmstead, if you can wrap it up as well. I will. Can you afford an attorney? Would you be willing to subject yourself to the decisions of the planning board? No one else should either. How many lawsuits can the town afford? We've had some. 
The statute requires building inspectors, electrical inspectors, wiring inspectors to be educated and licensed. Not so planning board members. To become a member of the planning board, you only need to get elected. The planning board is simply a group of seven citizens of the town who have been elected to their position. They do not need to pass any test. They only need to get your vote. Planning board members do not need any specific education or any particular knowledge of zoning and planning. Planning board members do not need to understand the rules, do not even need to understand the rules that they are responsible for enforcing. Mr. Holmes, we're they, stepping outside of the scope of the motion, so if, if you could wrap it up, I, I don't think give, the Give me the about 30 seconds and I will be finished. Okay. I, I don't think the commentary on the planning board is appropriate for this motion, however. Well, I can start again in motion 21 if you'd like. I was elected to the planning board in 1974 and I served for three years and I can assure you that I am not qualified to make the evaluations that the planning board is asking you to give them the right to make now. I am also concerned that where the zoning board does not say how the planning board will, that the zoning board changes do not tell us how the planning board goes about the evaluation process. Uh, electrical inspectors and plumbing inspectors have rules and regulations that he or she needs to follow. How about the planning board? Where are the rules and regulations that applications need to meet? I see none. I strongly urge you to vote no on articles 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Thank you. We're going to move around the audience. So starting, I, I believe Ms. Dwight, you had your hand up first, or I'm sorry, you'll be next. Hi, Lily Dwight, thank you. Um, there's a lot of territory covered here, but I would like to begin by saying that the planning board had numerous public meetings on this and I had the pleasure of attending, I think all of them, I don't know. They hire consultants when they don't understand something. And um, so that aside, the, let's, 50 years ago, if you want to go there, Hadley was farms and roses. Look at Hadley now. Hadley's tax rate is barely better than ours, barely. The town of Dennis, which has a formula-based business bylaw like this, their tax rate is less than half of ours, as is Chatham's as well. The unemployment rate, you're talking about business, our unemployment rate is better than Hadley's, or East Hampton. East Hampton, have you seen five and 10 lately? Good Lord, it's horrifying. And so this is a question. The other point I'd like to make is our current bylaws all mention uh, neighborhood characteristics with no specificity. And this is why your beloved Dollar General had to spend two years coming back and forth because there's no specificity. So this bylaw actually says, here are three things that if you're a chain store, you need to change to fit the neighborhood, not necessarily right next door to you, but the neighborhood. And that's a process where neighbors come to the planning board, their duly elected representatives, and they speak to their perception of what their neighborhood should look like. Uh, I think that was about it, but my basic point is, do we wanna look like Hadley? Well, oh, actually, sorry, one other point. How we grow is very different now than in the 1970s. Lots of malls are empty now. The internet has changed the world. People don't go to porn stores anymore. They buy it online because they don't want their neighbors to see it. Thank you. Uh, this is Charlene Galinsky again. I'm just... Uh, here because I really believe in the importance of balance. And I feel so many of the finance board has really looked at how can we balance uh, inviting businesses here, keeping it rural, keeping the, the hometown that I had the pleasure and continue as long as I stay healthy for 71 years. My concern is this. Businesses are being targeted, and I know Dollar General has put Deerfield on the map because you can't get the recorder without reading an article about it. But I'm now concerned about uh, 
Dollar General. What I'm concerned about is we have a tremendous amount of property in Deerfield that is owned by nonprofits. And lucky, lucky for the people who live in those houses, they don't ever, ever have to worry about having their taxes raised because there are no taxes being paid by individuals. I am envious of them because I'm a taxpayer and my husband and I have a few pieces of property. So we see the impact when the taxes go up. So nonprofits, we have a large amount. And I've looked at and done my adding, about for a little over 400,000 is given as a gift to the town, which is wonderful. However, on a yearly basis, it's a, a, almost 250,000. There has to be, has to be <laughs> millions of dollars worth of tax money that we no longer get from these buildings or homes. So it, it doesn't even put a drop in the bucket as far as um, getting that money back. And I, I just want to say a quick note. I happen to be on an organization in another town, which is a nonprofit. And we have four pieces of property that really don't need to be taxed. But our organization has felt, in all sincerity, that they should pay their full share of taxes because of all the benefits the town gives us. Water, well not water, but fire, police, road care. We're very fortunate to have that. And without paying taxes to help the town, we felt rather... And so we do pay those taxes in full. We don't even get a reduced rate. So nonprofits can, if they wanted to, give more in lieu of the taxes. So we have the nonprofit loss of revenue. And then we have taxpayers who have to pick that or absorb that. And now we're possibly going to lose new businesses coming into town. I'm worried as a taxpayer, and so should people sitting here, be worried about not being able to afford their houses much longer because we have no way to offset these taxes. So I know Dollar General is probably the impetus for why this became an article. When I controlling businesses, the way the article is written, I, I can see where a business would turn their back and say, thank you, but no thank you. And unless people are very independently wealthy, our taxes will continue to go up. And nobody minds paying for taxes when it's fair to everybody. But right now, the taxpayer is absorbing so much more because of, as Skip said, loss of businesses and loss of um, homes. We know how one part of town went for a million dollars and they went to very wealthy people whose children are at one of the nonprofits. And you know most likely that house will be donated to the town as a gesture and then bingo, we lose some more taxes. So I'm just concerned as a taxpayer that we can honestly think about balance. We need never to try to discourage something that can help us. And nobody, Lily, nobody wants a Route 9 in Deerfield. I don't want a Route 9. But if we've got a good board of everybody in town, you can control that. You can control that. But unfortunately, the Dollar General fiasco, and I understand we're in court with that, so there's some more ta tax dollars because there have been you know, concerns about that. We need to think of the taxpayer. It, it just seems in the last few years of my coming to town meeting, everything gets voted in, all our taxes go up, and nobody, nobody really gets nervous about it. I'm nervous about it. And I'm nervous for our young children and the people who are going to have to keep this town going. Please consider never discouraging businesses but being, being a little more cautious how we do it. Thank you. Uh, we'll start in the back. Hi there, I'm Mary Cloutier, um, 51 Eastern Ave. Um, I just wanna say that alarmism aside, we don't know 
what businesses we think may or may not in the future come here, let alone know what they may or may not think of our bylaws. Um, these bylaws are written not to discourage business. They're written to give business a roadmap. Um, we don't want it to look like Hadley. This is the way to prevent that. We want to be business friendly. Um, and this is the way we feel we can go about it. You are all always invited to every planning board meeting where all of these things are talked about for hours and hours at length and we invite public comment every time. So please, come to a planning board meeting. Uh, right here. Jennifer Remillard, Conway Street. Um, you talk about what's gone on in business for 50 to 70 years. I hate to tell you what attracts people, younger people, to communities is change. You can't build a business model on something that happened 50 to 70 years ago. Um, I just received my MBA in 2015. Everything has changed from when I graduated in 1997 with my associate's degree. You have to adapt, modify, and do things to bring new residents as well as new businesses. You're talking about worrying about taxes going up on individual properties. Well, if you don't make change in a community, you're not going to attract younger residents. You're going to age out and people aren't going to come back here to want to live because it's not accessible to the community. This proposal only um, applies to businesses that are 10 and more worldwide. So if you have Shislux Market, it's one. If they want to expand to four within the community, it doesn't apply to them. It doesn't apply to existing structures. So if you're worried about Greg's Garage on Route 5 and 10, they don't have to comply. They are safe. All of the existing businesses are safe. It doesn't apply to services. And this has been in conversation since 2008. It's not new. It's 2021. We need change in order to have sustainability within Deerfield. So this applies to a chain. It applies to, hey, you want to have a new Dunkin' Donuts come in on 5 and 10? Well, now it has to look like the one in Williamsburg or whatever the planning board and the community comes together to, to make the change. I moved here from Northampton where Prop 2 and a half overrides passed on a regular basis. I am aware what happens when you don't have a tax basis. If you look at the exorbitant rents in Northampton and then some of the buildings here in town that were purchased by the uh, people who own Leo's Tables building, that square corner, their rents are $1,500, $1,700. So if you want to make change, maybe talk to them about lowering their rents to attract different businesses because that's actually not fair market value for a community like Deerfield. So look your resources, look at the business research, and then you can make an adaptable change. But this does not affect existing business. It's been a discussion since 2008. The sustainability plan has been um, on board since 2000 to make changes, and this has been consistent. And if you haven't been going to town meetings since you've been a resident this entire time of your life, and you're only here now, why didn't you come here before to make those proper positive changes 20 years ago, 30 years ago, to make an effect today? Thank you. Uh, right in the back. Hi, Sean Durrett, uh, Sugarloaf Street. Um, I'd like to spend just a couple minutes waxing poetic. Uh, my family has lived here since 1964. I grew up in this town. Uh, I remember when Rogers and Brooks was where Cheslix is and there was a soda fountain at the pharmacy and buying penny candy at Fair Street Market. Those are the kind of businesses that made an impact on my childhood, not Walmart, not Dollar General, not Dunkin' Donuts. I'd like to remind you of a few of the businesses that have come to our town more recently. Leo's Table, Bueno Isano, The Giving Circle, Atlas Farm, Hillside Pizza, The Day Lily. Those are the businesses that my family frequents and that makes an impact on my family life right now. Wouldn't it be great if something like the YMCA wanted to come to our town? Guess what? 
That's a service. They're not going to be impacted by this proposal. The businesses that would be impacted are, and I'm just going to put my views fully out there, the tacky gross chains like Dollar General that I don't want in my town. I want the small businesses. I want to support small businesses. I want more restaurants in this town. I want a coffee shop where that horrible eyesore of the old Cumbies market is. Um, and I fully support these proposed bylaws. Just catch that over there and then we're gonna move to the middle. Hi, Lynn Rose, Three McClellan Farm Road, Deerfield. So whoever said that we didn't, this came up because of Dollar General. I was on the planning board for seven years. I don't know, it's been a long time, but we looked at it back then, and but there wasn't a lot of precedent. And so in the more recent years, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks downloading all kinds of models from all over uh, Massachusetts and the United States and sent them to the planning board to work with. And it wasn't, it, it's been a long time coming. There's been a lot of public meetings and a lot of debate. This didn't just show up. We have been thinking about it. There is precedent. Uh, the concerns were addressed a little earlier, so I won't go back into them about how it affects um, what types of businesses come. It's really about, you know, if you move to Deerfield because it's an agricultural community, um, if we want to preserve that character as a planning board person that spent a lot of time, we actually got money at one time to evaluate uh, five and 10, so it wouldn't turn into a Route 9, and at the time, we thought the, the properties were too small you know, to really attract any kind of chain businesses or things that might change the character. And then with Dollar General, we learned that, and that that wasn't necessarily the case. So we really do need to think ahead if we want to plan. Without planning and guidance in our zoning bylaws, we cannot regulate who and what comes. Thank you. Mr. James. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Peter James, and uh, uh, I've been around for a while. I'm a newcomer in town, however. I've only been here for 45 years. and practiced a little law while I was here at that same time. Um, I thought, you know, I hesitated to comment and all, but I decided I'd give it a shot. Um, I fully recognize the work that the planning board has gone through to articulate these particular regulatory changes. Um, I also want to emphasize that the Dollar General store permitting process came in sideways and in my mind as a professional, I've been an attorney in the area for 45 years, it's still sideways. It's bad facts and it's bad, bad law. But what it has done, it has created discussion. And I think that what's being brought forward today is a reflection of that discussion. Um, there have been a lot of casualties in the process. Uh, there are people that have left the planning board during the process just because it was embittered. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, as I approach things, um, and, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank Al Olmsted for reminding me. Uh, before I became an attorney, one of my jobs was a, as a construction carpenter uh, for the people that built the Mountain Farms Mall in Hadley. So I did a year of servitude uh, as a carpenter there, and I can attest to you that that land is the worst land in the world to farm. In fact, one of the first buildings that we did, the, the side of the building fell down because the clay was so unstable. Um, so I did get to watch that, and I'd been a, a resident in Hadley, and watched how the strip developed in Hadley to what it is today. Certainly it's different, and those considerations are necessary. Um, I also was reminded by Al of the first case I ever did as an attorney uh, in permitting, uh, and I've done a lot of permitting in the meantime, uh, was when I represented a group of fellows from Northampton who wanted to purchase the Dana Chevrolet building. By the way, that's the orchard in front of Pelican Products, that empty space. And they had a wonderful plan for developing three units in that building for diff different types of small business. Well, I can remember very vividly that as I made my presentation to the zoning board that night, uh, that we weren't going to get anywhere. Uh, and the zoning board's attorney gave me my papers back uh, before they even made a decision. We didn't get to first place. The building was torn down. 
the jobs were lost, and we went forward. I can also tell you that in one of my volunteer positions in this town, I was on the Conservation Commission. And we did some pretty hefty stuff. Um, but I learned a lesson on that. I was the chair of the commission when Nimwak tried to build the dam uh, on the Stillwater River. And that was a situation that involved the feds, the state, and unfortunately us as a community. Well, we re did a real good job of beating those folks up. And I made it my personal obligation to see that they left town fast. Well, they didn't get their permit and they went on their way because of a variety of tactics I had learned in the process. But you know, I came out of that saying, look, I wasn't fair. I didn't properly respect the rules in front of me. I got my way, but I didn't properly respect my rules. I also want to tell you a little story about the fact of Yankee Candle Company, which now is a multinational company which would come under your guidelines for uh, all of the efforts that are being made in this legislation to protect it. I represented the people that sold the land to Yankee Candle. So I was there at the beginning. I was also on the Conservation Commission, got the opportunity to deal with all of the permitting necessary uh, to deal with a building that was built on a two-foot water table. Every time they did something, they had to come in and swap building for cattails because of the Conservation Act. And that, and that really gained foment in the early 80s. The point that I'm trying to make is that we worked with Yankee Candle because we thought that guy, and that was one guy, Mike Kittredge came in with a dream and a bank loan. He didn't have a thousand people working for him. He was there with a couple of people. He came in and he made his idea work. He was very respectful for the community, made a lot of money. Uh, and at this point in time, Yankee Candle is the largest employer in Western Massachusetts. So when you look at this stuff, you've got to figure out how is this going to play out? Because somebody is either going to come into town and, and deal with the two years of administrative hassle that this permitting costs, or they're going to make a decision not to come. Now, I think that the, I have concerns with the massiveness of this legislation because I think that the process can be done in a much more limited vein. We have an awful lot of smart people that are running these committees and they're very dedicated. I think there's a micromanaging effect here that will chill permitting by businesses that want to be successful in the community. I don't have the answer to that. I've been doing permitting now for probably 40 to five, 45 years, and I have permitted for some of the nastiest entities in the world. And, 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 and I have done that in a style that is complementary to what the town is offering, that involves negotiating with towns and, and comes to a conclusion that's workable. So my, my goal in this discussion with you is to say, yes, I've, I've grown with a community. And by the way, my wife worked for Billy Rickevitz at the soda fountain at the, at the Frontier Pharmacy. Um, and I won't tell you how many years ago that was. Um, but but I, I, I think that, I personally, I, I, have, I have a concern of the focus on chain stores. Uh, I think some chain stores can be good, some can be bad. I think there's too much to this legislation. I'm not asking you to, to approve it or not approve it, but I'm trying to ask you to understand what you're dealing with here today and how it impacts the future. And frankly, I'm not gonna be around that much longer. I'm not gonna be an attorney a after the end of this year, and I'm getting kinda old. But I, but I wanted you to know that there's a process here and if it's done by well-meaning people with the understanding of where you need to grow, then you advance the legislation. This is pretty heavy duty and I'm gonna have to leave it to you folks to see if you wanna do this all in one felt swoop or you wanna do in pieces. Thank you. Thank you. We should really try to wrap up debate here, folks. If you have something new to say, please, and you feel it's important, we'll recognize you, but be mindful. Mr. Camosa, briefly. He has? Not on this article, I don't believe.
But it, with all due respect, Mr. Moderator, there's a lot of um, facts here that can implicate uh, hard times for our community. Um, this article uh, really should be tied in with 19 and 20, but it's not. Uh, the problem with this is, first of all, it's a st uh, substantially the same, but not necessarily identical. I call it willy-nilly, because I've heard some conversations that if a large chain wants to come in, well, they can work with us. That's not the case. It specifically says that they are prohibited. If the planning board wants them to be acceptable, there should be language in here saying what they need to do to be acceptable. Now, I saw something on the internet where a planning board member had two pictures of a Dunkin' Donuts. Do you want this one, and I'll say the modern one, or the second one, the colonial one? So most people might say in Deerfield, we want the colonial one. So what happens if Dunkin' Donuts comes to town and the planning board says, well, you know, we want to have the colonial one. Everybody's a winner, right? And Dunkin' Donuts says, oh, that's no problem. We have 400 of those colonial ones. Now it meets their, it breaks their own bylaw. They can't allow that because it's, they have more than 10 worldwide. So it's like this sheep within, like, well, that's exactly what it says. If they want to amend it and change the wording, they can do that. Now, you know, it's, uh, and if you go into it even deeper, you, you can't have an olive garden here, but you can have an H&R Block. You can't have a CVS store, but you could have a Jiffy Lube. You can't have a Big Y store, but you could have a Midas Muffler. You can't have a Whole Foods, but you could have an Enterprise Car Rental, a Goodyear Tire Center, Waste Management, and the list goes on. You know, over the last 20 years, I, the, town hasn't, the town hasn't had a problem, um, you know, with new businesses. Matter of fact, in the last 20 years, we've only had two new businesses come to town. That's Pilot Precision and the Ideal Movers. And I personally had to almost grovel to keep those applications going because they were, I, I don't, I'm trying to be nice here. They were persecuted by the planning board. And I was on the planning board because we don't have specific rules, we have ideas. It's the ideology that what we're trying to do. You have a rule, you don't want a specific look, you put it on paper and then you can follow it. I just think that that's what we need to do. Um, I, I use the term willy-nilly, but there's a legal term. It's called arbitrary and capricious. And that's why we get into a lot of problem. It's gonna continue. Thank you. I'm just gonna emphasize again that we really need to focus on the motion and more importantly, the planning board is an elected board through, through our town election. So comments on them or their performance are really not appropriate as part of this discussion in my mind. So. There's a question over here. Hi, I'm Raloon Bialik. I live at 66 Sugarloaf Street. Um, I just want to speak very briefly in support of these bylaw changes. First of all, I appreciate the list of businesses that you mentioned, Skip, and I know that businesses have closed, but none of those closed businesses, as far as I understand it, would have been affected by this bylaw. Those were all smaller private businesses. This bylaw only affects, as I understand it, really the chains, the franchises, and those people, the people that run those businesses, they don't have any interest in the good of our community, or they don't keep the bulk of the money in this town. What we want to appeal to are more private, smaller businesses. And I think in making these bylaws this change, then it will, the, the, it's going to make more thoughtful, more beautiful development which will benefit all because it will make it more appealing for other small businesses to move here, to open here. It'll be better for the residents. It will bring new residents. It will, it, it will be better for the tourism money that comes in. People will come and they'll go to these other businesses as well. Um, property values will rise. That will bring more income to the town. Um, so I think it, you know, we need to think long term. We can't just try to appeal to these to these bulk franchise businesses. I don't think that that's gonna help us in the long term. Thank you. Right here in blue. Um, okay, so a couple things. I'm Kathy Bertinison from North Hillside Road. Um, I just, just a uh, uh, 
point, which is that whatever we've been doing for the last 50 years, if all these businesses are leaving, it's time to do something different. And I applaud the planning board for all the work they've done on this. I'm also really disturbed by some of the statements that people have made, including the initial finance committee statement that certain things on that list, that list is a definition of what the formula-based businesses are. It's not forbidding any of those businesses. It's just saying these are the businesses that would meet that guideline. So they would not be banned from Deerfield. So that was untrue. Um, and um, also the things that Mr. Camosa was saying. <coughs> Nobody's being banned. We're asking people to work with the town. And if this was in place before, maybe we wouldn't have had all the problems that we've had um, with our snafu with the Dollar General. Thank you. Somewhere up here. Thank you. My name is Tolly Stark. I'm on Keats Road. Thank you guys all for coming out today and sitting out in the sun on a Saturday to be part of our community. I definitely appreciate being here and seeing all your faces. Um, I just wanted to point out a few things about the uh, formula-based business bylaw. The articles 18 through 20. Um, essentially, that is not a prohibition of a business that is a chain store. Um, I've heard a lot of misinterpretation about that, but it's very clear that what is prohibited is the standardized facade. Essentially, what is prohibited is the standardized chain store look. It does not mean a chain store cannot come into Deerfield in the permitted zoning areas. I just want to clear that up for everyone. I also wanted to mention real quickly, I've heard a lot of talk about the past, but I haven't heard that much about the future. Here we see a planning board picking up the mantle for our future, looking towards what we want to create and getting away from what we know we don't want. We want to see storefronts in Deerfield. We want businesses to come to Deerfield. The question is, how do we want them to come? That is what these articles provide. They provide a tool to say, this is how we would like you to come and fit into the rural character of Deerfield. You're not out in the Midwest. You're not out in California. You're in the Northeast. You're in Deerfield. When you come here, we want you to know that. Deerfield is a tourist destination. Yankee Candle is like number two for the state that brings tourism around. We have Treehouse Brewing Company that just came here. Another new business, despite the fact that I've heard people say no businesses have been coming here. Treehouse Bring Brewing Company is here. And one of the reasons they chose to be here is because of our rural character. If you vote to pass articles 18 through 20, you are voting to say, we want chain stores to fit into Deerfield. That is what you will be voting for. Thank you. There's a call to question. It's been seconded. No, no, come on. Give us a chance to respond. That's baloney. We went how long on the other article, and now you're going to call the question? That's ridiculous. There's several people that want to speak and to respond to that, and you should let that happen. It's not democratic. That's... Mr. Upton, it's not appropriate to speak out, out like that. Uh, I have no ability when the, the question is called. The, the solution is simple. Just vote to not call the question. I don't have any ability to do anything beyond that. It's in your own bylaws. I, I'm only here to enforce them. I'm not here to say it's fair. No, I don't think it's appropriate to applaud either. I'm just trying to make it clear to everybody that we're turning on each other, and this is the system we have in place. So let's have an honest and open debate and do it in a way that's respectful to everybody. And if people wish to speak further, then let's let them do that through the opportunity to vote this down. But it's your call, not mine. So the question's been called and seconded. All those in favor of calling the question.
All those opposed? Uh, the motion to call the question is successful. So we're now voting on Article 18. All those in favor, and this requires a two-thirds majority, so I'll have to count again. All those in favor. Opposed? The motion carries. Article 19, Ms. Wolfkill. Cool. That was good. Article 19 and Article 20 are paired with Article 18. I move the town to vote to amend the Town of Deerfield Zoning Bylaws, Chapter 179, Section 2, 2200, by adding a footnote after the existing footnote 10 as set forth in the warrant. Second. Second. Ms. Wolfkuhl, briefly. Again, this is a companion article to Article 18, or 19 and 20, 18, 19, 20, uh, with, I think, probably many of the same um, pros and cons, so um, I'm not sure that much discussion will be needed. Finance Committee? The comments I made earlier apply both to 19 and 20 as well. Mr. Pereski, do you have a comment? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. My, um, first of all, I'm, on, I'm all for restricting what Route 5 and 10 is going to look like, and we need a way to do that. My problem is with the language of the Article 18 in conjunction with 19. Article 18 defines the kind of businesses that Article 19 applies to, and Article 19 just says any of these businesses are prohibited, period. It doesn't say it's up to the discretion of the planning board. Um, the way I see it's written is Whole Foods, which I personally would like to see come to town with a building less than 4,500 square feet, couldn't do it because it's prohibited, period. That's, that's, I think we need to loosen up the language a little bit and unfortunately take some subjectiveness. Well, I say unfortunately because then you get willy-nilly, but um, again, I think it's too, too restrictive. That's my say on it. Come back. Mr. Hilchey. Tim Hilchey, Greenfield Road. Firstly, I'd like to read footnote 11, which is the subject of Article 19. It says, within, C1 and all C within all C1 and all C2 commercial zoning districts, here's the important words, excepting the most northerly C2 district, which means anything can go there. It can look like anything. It can be any size that's permitted under our current bylaws. So no prohibition. If they don't want to change their facade, they move up north. Um, except uh, formula-based businesses that conform to definitional elements four, five, and six, meaning they won't change their outside facade, they won't alter their sign, or they, they won't um, consider changing the color scheme, then they can go to the northern district and build what they want. So. Um, I'm just trying to address my points to the article itself. There's been a lot of talk about prohibition when the articles themselves clearly say, if you want to work with the planning board, you can change your facade and you can build anywhere in the C1 and C2 districts. 
If you don't want to change your facade, you can go up north and build what you want. Right behind you. Jonathan Angstrom, um, Sugarloaf Street. Can you just explain where C1 and C2 is for a district? Because it sounds prohibited. Ms. Wolfgo? To a large with? extent, the C1 and C2 are up the 510 corridor. So you're talking Deerfield Academy, um, the, the soccer fields, the farming? No. Uh, Trevor or so, so C1 and C2 were kind of starting at the Waitley line and coming up kind of each, each side of the road um, I, th I believe C2 is just a very small section up by um, uh, Richardson's Candy Kitchen you know kind of there's a couple of businesses there Yankee Peddler and that, and that kind of thing um, or Yankee store um, that that's it the C3 district is 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 up by the asphalt plant there is no commercial business really other than industrial I mean it's commercial but there is no traffic up there really. thank you mr. Kamosa we'll come back to the table after that I'd like a little more clarity as to what the planning board feels the C2 northern district is um, all of my experiences it's around the rail yard and Cheapside Bridge. It is on the zoning map. And uh, so basically what it does is it excludes all of the property and my property. Um, I think this type of proposal, you know, it's a town of inclusion. Everybody wants to have everybody come, to, you know, and be friendly and all this other stuff. Well, what we're basically saying is that my property is not important. You know, you can't have that type of business where I have or other people that own that. We can pay big taxes. We can't get big dollars for rent, and so we subsidize it all the time. Or well, it's a choice, or take it down. But anyways, um, I, I think that everybody can read for themselves. It basically says, the formula-based businesses that conform to the definitions, elements four, five, or six, herein are prohibited. So until there's language, you're basically saying they're prohibited. To me, that's discriminatory. You know, it's racist, or not racist, but uh, bigoted. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got a whole cl class of business people that can't come there. The people at the table had their hands up for a while. Yeah. Julie? I'd like to make an amendment to the Article 19 to strike the words are prohibited and insert must include in the required site plan review amendment of exterior elements included in definitional items four, five, or six, if deemed necessary by the planning board to mitigate the visual impact on the neighborhood. It's a substantive change. <laughs> I'll say it again slowly. <laughs> We're gonna take out our prohibited and insert must include in the required site plan review Amendment of exterior elements included in definitional items four, five, or six. So that's those are the ones that are prohibited. That's the exterior, like the sign and the paint scheme and all that. If deemed necessary by the planning board to mitigate the visual impact on the neighborhood. That's significant enough so we deem that public hearing, no? We're going to recess for about 30 seconds, or just stand by, please don't. It's too loud. I think it's clear. So this is how I say she's clarifying. Because it really doesn't prohibit it. Well, if that's what they want to say, that's what they want to say. All doesn't prohibit it. What it does is say, if you adjust any of these things up here, you could still come forward. Yeah. That's what the bottom is. You're prohibited unless you can adjust them. So this is just clarifying. Um, the front of it. The front part. <coughs> there's just a question when there's an, an amendment on whether there was proper notice under the articles that were 
in the paper or, or that were published. So um, council feels that this is within the scope because there is not a current prohibition in the language that's there. So, so the motion is legally fine. And there's been a second to the amendment. Are there any questions on the amendment? Briefly. Uh, Andrew Ness, 10 Old Albany Road. Uh, I would urge everyone to vote against the amendment. We don't have it in writing. We don't know, no, we haven't had time to look at it. We just heard the language read out to us. We don't know what its lasting impact is or not. It was just posed up here, so I don't think there's been proper time. Even if it's okay legally from a legal perspective, none of us have had a chance to look at it in writing and see really what the impact is. So I would urge to go with the language that's in writing now that we can all see and we can all evaluate whether you're for it or against it. We should just be evaluating the language that we can see right now. And not in any way to prohibit, but I'm happy to read it again if somebody would like to hear it again too. That's a, an option at any time, so don't be. To see if the town will vote to amend, uh, article, amend Article 19 to strike the words are prohibited and insert must include in the required site plan review an amendment of exterior elements included in definitional items 4, 5, or 6 if deemed necessary by the planning board to mitigate the visual impact of the neighborhood. Thus, the bylaw will read as follows. Uh, within all C1 and C2 commercial zoning districts, excepting the most northerly C2 district, formula-based businesses that conform to definitional elements four, five, or six herein must include in the required site plan review amendment of elements included in definitional terms, in definitional items, definitional items four, five, or six, if deemed necessary by the planning board to mitigate the visual impact on the neighborhood. I believe your hand was up first, right over here, and I'll come to you next. Thank you. Tolly Stark, Keats Road. Um, I just want to urge everyone to vote down against this amendment. Um, changing this language also weakens the tools that the planning board has to negotiate when it comes to making these changes. Anyone who was involved in the public hearing process for this would know that there was actually a more restrictive version of this uh, formula-based business bylaw that, can be f that came before the planning board. And the planning board has already made adjustments and diluted this so it would fit better for Deerfield. Any further dilution at this point, I think would have much more of a detrimental impact on even having this bylaw in the books at all. Right in the front. Ava Gibbs, River Road. Well, um, at first I thought it was okay, and I, then I went, well, wait a moment. What is this if need, is it if need be? See, I don't have it in front of me, and I'm a reader, but I think it said if need be. If need be means, see. If, if deemed necessary, I don't mean to deemed interrupt. No, please, thank you. If deemed necessary um, is another, see, the way it's written now, it's very simple. Not the only thing that's prohibited, and not chain stores are not prohibited. It's simply that we don't want their facades and signage, you know? It's pretty simple. I have to tell you that the Dennis Planner, the Dennis Mass Planner, uh, told us that every chain store that wanted to come in was happy to come in and agree to, uh, you know, have a better facade. They had no problem and, and all, you know, they have like at least two Dunkin' Donuts and some other stuff. So, yeah, and even Dollar Tree, all right. But my point is that by this amendment seems okay and then you go if deemed necessary, how about 10 years from now when we have different, you know, whatever. I think that we should stick with the original one. The word prohibition seems to grate on the planning, on the uh, finance committee, you know, they don't like it, but it's not prohibiting anything except the facades of chain stores. Thank you very much. Any other yes. comments on Mr. McDaniel, and then we'll go to the back. So <clears throat> I just, you know, I think the word prohibitive is, is grading a bit on those that are concerned because 
because of the, the fear of what the business community will feel when they're looking to come to Deerfield. And if, if prohibited is kind of removed and, and this, this bylaw change or this amendment would, um, would kind of get rid of that one negative word and do the same thing that the, that the advocates are saying that it would do, uh, the whole idea is they aren't prohibited as long as they kind of do the same aspects that you're asking for. Um, I don't think it's a substantive change. It just it's just kind of getting rid of an, a word that I, I felt was a bit concerning for businesses coming to town. Um, if it if it does the same work without without having that kind of negative word in there, it might might be a good compromise. So I'll, I'll be for the amendment. Uh, there was a gentleman in the back got his hand up. Um, I'm not averse to the principle underlying the proposed amendment. I just want to point out that every time you pin your hopes or your language to site plan approval, which again is not sanctioned by statute, you are inviting a legal challenge which you will probably lose. So I simply say change say, in the opinion of the planning board and remove the word site plan approval. And we have to, in the long run, we have to get rid of this idea that site plan, of hanging our hat on site plan approval. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna catch this one just because the mic's there and then we'll come up front again. Uh, I'm, right, right, oh. We're all set in the front then. Pat Ryan, Greenfield Road. I'm going to make a very boring editorial comment <laughs> um, because I'm an editor. Um, the word mitigate bothers me. I think that we're opening ourselves up to litigation when we water this down. It's very clear the way it is prohibited simply means not permitted. If you want two words instead of one word, you can do that. And it's not a substantial change. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but if it's not substantial, why mess with it? Thank you. Mr. Peresi, grab that mic. My, my only question is where is the language that says they can alter what they're going to bring to town and be permitted. I don't see any language that says if they alter the facade, they're, they're allowed to come into town. Article 18, I might, give, might lose my numbers here. Article 18 just gives the definition of what kind of businesses need to be looked at or considered for this. Article 19 says they're prohibited. So maybe, I, I agree with the content. I, I, I love what we're doing, but I just think it's worded wrong. I think it doesn't, there's no flexibility in it the way it's currently worded. Where does it say that um, the planning board or whomever can look at something and say if they change the facade, they're allowed? That's not what it says. It says a business with a standard facade cannot come into town or be prohib is prohibited from those districts. I, again, I'd like to say, where is the language allowing a change? Town Council would, would like to address that. So if the applicant does not meet one of those definitional criteria, then it's not prohibited. That's the point. So if they come in with a facade that's not standardized, then they're permitted. That's the point of the definitions. It doesn't say facade. It doesn't say facade, though. It says well, business. It, a business that has a standard facade so you have, to read, you have to read the whole, the whole table to understand that if they don't meet those criteria, they're not considered a standardized business. Uh, the vote's been called, so. Um, on the amendment. On the amendment. So uh, all those in favor to call the vote. We're just calling the vote on this vote. Call the question. 
Uh, I'm sorry, let's be clear. So we're just calling the vote to see if we're going to vote on the amendment. That's all we're doing now is decide whether to vote on the amendment. The amendment's not being voted on. Opposed? That carries by two thirds. So now we're moving, I'm sorry, we're going to move to vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment as presented. Uh, and opposed? That, the amendment does not carry. So now we're back to the underlying uh, motion, and that debate is still open. Call the vote. Thank you. Uh, uh, all those in favor of calling the question? Opposed? The question has been called, so we now will take a vote on Article 19. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries by two thirds. Article 20, Ms. Wolfgold? Yes, I move the town vote to amend the town of Deerfield zoning bylaws, chapter 179, section 2200, by adding a notation of footnote 11 to the following list of commercial uses within the C1 and C2 districts as set forth in the warrant. And as we mentioned before, this is a companion um, article with 19 and 18. Was there a second? Thank second. You. Thank you. Finance? Any? Uh, Finance Committee doesn't have any further comment, no. Any questions or discussion? One over here. Is there a mic over here? Okay, um, Rini Gripko Clancy, I resent not being able to speak at the, the discussion session for Article 18. I wrote an article for my turn, it was published in Thursday's Recorder against this proposal. It's actually Article 18. I think you've made it, well, you've, you've made your choice, but my article, I won't read it because it's barn door's been shut. But you are telling small businesses, the ones we want to come here, a 10 chain, 10 establishment business is not a chain store to me. And you're saying to those folks, you know, you're gonna have to do an awful lot of stuff. And they're gonna say, well, I'm gonna go to Sunderland or I'm gonna go to Conway or Waitley. Uh, what you're doing is you're opening the door for the big businesses to come in. They'll jump through any hoops the planning board wants. They don't care, they've got name recognition. You're gonna turn, instead of 25 ugly box stores along five and 10, you're gonna have 25 quaint looking box stores. It does nothing to stop development. It's selling small businesses. You, you're gonna to have to do an awful lot to come here. And they're not gonna come here, thank you. In the front, the next. Just to clarify, this bylaw, 18 and 19, does not apply to small businesses. They are exempt from it. And this is actually protective of them. Um, that's kind of water under the bridge. We've, we've actually now voted Articles 18 and 19. But um, 
the, the point of, of Article 20 is just to set that footnote into the table of uses. It's ministerial. It is not uh, uh, germane to the main content of the bylaw. Right there. Thank you. And Thank you, Debbie. You call the question? Uh, I recognize her. Okay. Hi, Lori Conlin, Hillcrest Avenue. And I, I'm, I have been really hesitant to speak here because I'm so, so new to this town and um, I really just want to listen and learn and respect your procedures. But um, one of the things that I respect the most is that everybody is able to give input here because just so you know, that is not how it works in all the communities here or elsewhere. I mean, elsewhere outside of Massachusetts. And so I have um, voted in favor of all the things that have um, been approved today, but I really, really support the process of the people who may not be in agreement to still have their say. So I voted to not take the vote before everybody has spoken. So the last woman who um, spoke said she resented not having her say, and that resonates with me because I came from a place like that, and one day you may find yourself in the minority, and there's no way to have your voice heard. So even though if you're voting with the majority or whatever, you still, it's really important to just keep this dialogue happening the way this community has developed, and I'm really grateful to be here and for that. And so be considerate of one another to everybody have their say, even when you don't agree with it. And also, this happens in a really, really um, civil, gentle, compassionate way, I think, where people are heard, and that also is not how it happens everywhere. So what you have here, what we now have here, is really um, golden, and just I encourage everybody to really think about that after today and move forward in that spirit. Thanks so much for letting me speak. We, we'll have you on several committees tomorrow morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there a, was there a, yes. Move the question. Thank you. Is, all those in favor of calling the question. Of course we do. Opposed. Article 20, all those in favor. Opposed. Motion carries by two-thirds majority. Article 21. Yes, Article 21, with many thanks to all of you who have stayed on for these last two articles. Uh, they are very important. I move the town vote to amend the Town of Deerfield Zoning Bylaws, Chapter 179, Section 3800, Solar Electric Installations, by amending the section by making modifications as set forth in the warrant. Second. Ms. Wolf, go briefly. <laughs> yes, um, these bylaws set clearer standards primarily for medium and large scale solar projects. Uh, why are we doing it? Solar is a very fast cha changing industry with lots going on, and I think many of us have read about, in particular, what's going on with this in Northfield and Shutesbury. Our bylaws definitely need to keep up. Uh, one of the big sections of this bylaws is that um, they protect the town from financial loss with abandonment and decommissioning, uh, including the uh, provision for financial sh surety. Uh, so the town is protected, and this is really important. It also minimizes, these bylaws also minimize the impact of medium and large scale solar on forest land and farmland in active production. The potential for large scale solar installations coming to town now, right now, is great. We need to update these regulations and our financial protections with recognizing that the planning board has the opportunity for further revisions for small solar installations, such as residential and small business. Right now, we want to protect Deerfield in relation to the medium and large scale solar, and we definitely do want to um, listen to the community and um, make recommendations in the future for small scale. Finance, somebody? Of course. <laughs> so we actually had quite a bit of discussion about this and our vote was split on it, but it did not, the motion did not pass on the finance committee. The good part that um, Annalie just covered, it updates it. Um, the escrow for disposal is very beneficial. Clarifying what is about allowed by right was good. The um, arg arguments against it 
One is that small solar installations can be up to 10,000 square feet are allowed by right. And if a homeowner installs 10,000 square, 10, square feet of solar panels on their property um, up to 10 feet from the boundary, this could reduce the property values of the neighboring property. Another argument against it was that there's no height limit for small scale solar energy installations um, and no height limit for roof mounted. And um, third is that there's provision for retaining funding in escrow for the disposal of medium and large scale ground mounted systems, but no provision for retaining funding for any roof mounted systems. Um, so the consensus of the group, it, it seemed to be that the existing bylaw is old, the update is needed. This update is good, but there are some significant issues, um, and those flaws caused some people to vote against it that um, made it not pass the Finance Just Committee. Clarification the roof yeah. Town Council would just like to make a clarification. Uh, regarding roof-mounted systems, those are fully controlled by the building code and could not be regulated under here. Good to know. Uh, any uh, so question in the front row? We'll come over here next. Sorry. Yep, we're good. Hi, Ava Gibbs on River Road. So um, I I was uh, I heard about this ten thousand square feet, you know, for little, for smaller installations. And what I there's two things that I understand about this. One is that the planning board is definitely going to work on the smaller ones. And two that, um, what's our electric company? Uh, Eversource. Eversource is not gonna allow anyone to build something that big. That is not allowable. So that's like a fear that will not happen. Uh, I, you know, so we are now talking about small and medium-sized solar installation. This, these, uh, the spilo covers it. If you read the recorder in the past few days, there were two letters to the editor from very respected people in town that urge us to vote for it. I don't know if they're here. The Swedelands, Alan and M.A., oh, they're not here, but they urged us to vote for it. And also David Gilbert Keith. Is he here? Uh, he couldn't make it either. But um, both, they are on this energy committee. They had great arguments. I urge us to vote for this, and then we will, uh, the planning board will vote will work on the small solar installation. Thank you. I'm just going to let Mr. Upton speak, and then we'll go here. I feel bad about the call to question. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a good trick, right? Call yeah. Call a question. <laughs> no, so, oh, I'm going to call a question. No. No, I'd like, to, I'd like to address this. And, and I think it's important for people to understand that Number one, this document is one of the most confusing documents I've ever read in my life, and I've read a lot of documents. And don't get me wrong, there's some good stuff in this document, especially when it comes to medium scale and large scale. There's no question about it. But it's very confusing, and let me explain. When you take a look at the page 27, right under the article, in parentheses, bold means new, and cross out means removed. So I brought this up to the planning board. And if you take a look on page 29, under roof mounted, third paragraph down, under roof mounted, it talks about small, medium, and large. Small, ground-mounted. Now, number one, I'm not big on ground-mounted. If you've ever seen ground-mounted solar arrays, usually there are uh, two, three feet of weeds around them, grass growing like crazy. But anyways, single resident or small business scale solar fixtures and associated control or conversion electronics or energy storage components occupying no more than 10,000 square feet of surface area. Now, obviously, Eversource does uh, address this to an extent, but Eversource is evolving too. And Eversource is not our bylaw. 
This particular document is the town of Deerfield's bylaw, and that's what's going to be enforced. So let me explain to you very quickly roughly about what 10,000 square feet means. If you take a look behind you or to your right and you look over at that football field, see those goal posts on the right hand side? And then go all the way down to the left hand side and look at the goal posts, all right? Now take a look at the stands there that people sit in. If you go up to the bottom edge of the railing, rough guess about 10 feet. So if you take that 10 feet and you multiply that football field by three times, you get your 10,000 square feet of solar. Do you want that next door to you? Now, obviously, you're saying that, well, Eversource is not going to allow that. Once again, it is monitored to an extent by Eversource, but Eversource is not your bylaw. The town of Deerfield and what it says is by the bylaw. Now, the planning board says that they're going to work on this. I'm sorry, but this bylaw is a legal binding document when you pass it. I don't know about you people, but I've always learned from a very young age that when you have a legal binding document, you read it, you make sure you understand it, you make sure your I's are dotted, your T's are crossed before you sign on the dotted line. You want to understand the language and you want to understand the ramifications of those languages. Now, that being said, it is a vote today to approve this is you're voting a legal document that needs to be worked on. Your planning board openly admits there's flaws to it. So why in the world would you vote a legally binding document for the town of Deerfield when my suggestion would be that you take four or five months, because all, we all know we're going to have a special town meeting, you take four or five months, let the planning board go back and work on this language, clean it up, and I'm sure there's several people, as I've already suggested, other committees that might even be willing to help them and provide resources, responsibilities, uh, you know, so on and so forth, to make sure that we have good, clear language in this legally binding document. So I would recommend voting no on this and having the plan board go back do the work that they should do and bring it back in the fall so we can vote it. Now, I'm, I'm sure there are people are going to say, well, you know, the big solar companies want to move in. You know, that means money and this and that and the next thing. All we have to do is say no. Two-letter word, no. Come back and see us in the fall once we get our bylaw straightened out. And I'm sorry, but how, I just, I can't imagine any committee bringing a bylaw to town and tell you that it's flawed, it needs work, but we still want your approval, and don't worry about it, we'll do it after, okay? So I'm recommending that people vote no. Thank you. Ms. Blaine? Yes, oops, sorry, Rachel Blaine, 261 Pinock Road. Um, thank you, Jeff. I would direct everybody back to the football field. And I would say that if your team got to the 60-yard line and said, good, let's have another play, pull in some of the other teammates, that would be what we would do here in Deerfield. I'm voting to say yes to this because our eye was on one goal, which was the medium and large scale, which we have actually had a number of uh, presentations over the several years that Kip and I served on the planning board. And each time we said, boy, we should have something in place for us to support us when we do meet with those big um, companies uh, that come in from out of town that want to use the great sunshine of Deerfield to, to their advantage and to the advantage of homeowner, um, landowners. So I, I, I bow to, um, to Jeff's um, characterization of uh, somehow a school child who hasn't completed all of her homework. I'm so sorry it seems like that. I don't feel that's the way we've presented it. 
Um, I do think that the small mounted is really an important piece. It's just the next piece. This hasn't been touched since 2010. Um, we're looking for solar in our, in our town, just as Chief is looking for hybrid vehicles, and we're all looking to make ourselves more um, mo sustainable and prepare a future for our children, which I've heard that a number of times, and I love that. Um, but I would say I welcome, I welcome the new quarterback on the team. I think this is a great project moving forward. We're absolutely committed in the planning board. So I vote for it, um, and I encourage you all to do the same. Thank you. Mr. St. Peter's. Walter Sadowski, Elm Circle. I make a motion that we postpone any votes on this at least till fall, till we have a time to uh, study it and for the, for the planning board to amend it. That's a motion to table. That's not debatable. Uh, a motion to table is what that's referred to, and uh, council advised me that's not debatable. If you can bear with me one sec. It is two-thirds? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it was a second, I believe. Was there not a second? There was. Okay. Uh, all those in favor to table the motion, may no action be taken on it today. All those in favor. Opposed? The motion is uh, the table is not successful. It's been called and seconded twice. Um, all, all those in favor of calling the question? So again, not the underlying motion. Opposed? Two thirds. That passes. Uh, so now we're voting on Article 21. All those in favor of Article 21? It is up. <laughs> it's just getting tired. Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Article 22, Ms. Wolfcool. Yes, again, with many thanks for all of you for staying through. Um, I move the town vote to amend the Town of Deerfield Zoning Bylaws, Chapter 179, Section 5400, 54, Site Plan Review, by amending this section as set forth in the warrant. A second. Thank you. Briefly? Yes, this uh, article. Uh, works to clarify objectives in our site plan review, but in particular also to establish green development standards to promote high quality development with fewer environmental and energy impacts to our town. It gives specifics on preserving the rural nature of our town and protecting our natural resources. We have a number of uh, town policies and plans, the master plan or complete streets, green infrastructure policy, and if we don't have regulations that actually can back these uh, policies up, then they're just pretty words on paper. So this is what this, uh, these bylaws attempt to do. In particular, the green development standards call for actions such as tree preservation, farmland protection, reduction of light pollution, and I'll mention very strongly that this is um, an opportunity for the developer to work with the planning board to the extent feasible. So many of these green development standards say as practicable as possible. We know that certain sites need special considerations and we want to be able to work with uh, developers to be able to, uh, to provide those 
accommodations. Um, the last piece of the green development standards that's kind of a fun piece is that there are incentivized standards so that in fact there are trade-offs. So if a developer wants something more such as partial waiver for parking space requirements, they can give us more such as protection of open space. This is purely optional but again it's an opportunity for some non-standardization for some um, developers to work with the planning board and a way to promote development in an environmentally responsible way. Thank you. Finance? Finance Committee did um, not support this article. Um, the items that arose in discussion, one is that there's a an adverse financial impact on upcoming municipal projects, because this applies to municipal projects as well as um, commercial projects. There is concern that there may not be a fair and consistent application of the rules because this states, um, the bylaw change states to the mac maximum extent practicable. Um, there is concern that it will alienate businesses who want to move to town, giving the impression that Deerfield is anti-business and harming our tax base. And then the other concern that was raised in discussion is that it's a very long bylaw with a lot of changes, um, which becomes burdensome to businesses. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Helchi. Uh, Tim Hilchie, Greenfield Road. Um, one of the things that I think that this is uh, that's interesting about. Oh, sorry, I'm told I'm not speaking loud enough. Um, the bylaws that uh, you brought to us. I just would direct this to Anna Lee uh, Wolfkull as the chairman of the committee. Um, they were developed based on bylaws that are in place elsewhere. Yes, um, we've looked at. I think over 18, 19 communities nearby, and um, so they, they very definitely have call, called from other communities in Western Mass. And did I understand correctly that you had um, a person who spent 40 years in planning and uh, so <laughs> forth to help you develop the bylaws? Absolutely. Chris Curtis, unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here today and can speak eloquently to um, the substance of these which have stood up in other towns in terms of promoting uh, ecological uh, uh, aspects of good development. And finally, um, with respect to the Finance Committee, and I do respect their opinions on this, um, we live in a community that everyone realizes is pretty wet. And so to the extent that climate change may have that impact and increase those problems, encouraging businesses and in some cases requiring businesses to build responsibly is probably in the best interest of the future of the town. Thank you. Call the question. You live by the call, you die by the call. So all those, all those in favor, uh, there was a second on the call of the question, so all those in favor of calling the question. Opposed? Yeah. I oppose. Motion carries. So. We're voting on Article 22. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries by two-thirds majority. <laughs> uh, I'm hesitant to do that, but I will. Briefly, very briefly. I didn't know where to fit this in to town meeting, but I really want to thank our select board, our board of health, for this year where they've worked so hard. <laughs> they've worked so hard to keep us safe, everybody. I just, I didn't know where to fit in, but thank you so much, board thank of you. health. Thank we, you. Thank you we owe our lives to you, really. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's what, one last comment. Quickly. Um, I just want to say, because this never came up, but I want to thank you for doing these bylaws, because 
people are worried about their taxes and all of this, but what I'm worried about is my property value. And if we don't have things in place to protect our town, then our property values will go down, and then where will we be? I just want that people Thank to you. think about that. I, uh, I'll be making a motion at this point. I move the meeting adjourned to meet in the... Uh, I'm actually going to dissolve. I, I, we hereby dissolve the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, FCAT. <laughs>